côté d'Arnaud Demar, le porteur du maillot jaune de la formation. Local dignitaries enjoying the moment to get the race underway. 183 riders remain in the race from the 198 who took the start line in Leeds over a week ago now. Stage 10, it's been a long stint for many riders waiting for the first rest day. Traditionally, this Monday would have been the rest day, but it is Bastille Day, so of course they have to race. The race leader of Frenchman and the French national champion signing the flag. Inside the final 10 seconds before they roll off. Sign of the cross a few times being made by Alberto Contador. Inside the last 10 seconds for the countdown. Stage 10 on Bastille Day rolls away. They've got 30 minutes before the white flag comes in from the lead car of the race director, Christian Prudhomme. And then the race will actually officially start and they'll start to knock off the kilometres through to the finish line. These are all bonus kilometres depending on which way you look at it. In fact, throughout this year's race, there's some 149 kilometres of neutral zone. That is effectively an additional stage for this year's race. The Sports Palace in Malouze, which holds some 3,700 people when it's full to capacity, holds plenty of sporting events, a few cultural events as well throughout the year. Malouze is a town with quite a few names. It's known as the European capital of technical museums with a range of industrial scale, industrial museums throughout the town. It's France's answer to Manchester. It was certainly one of Europe's industrial hubs. And finally, the city of 100 chimney stacks. Old factory red brick chimney stacks that you can see scattered throughout the town. This is the Saint Etienne Temple, which dates back to the 14th century. Tony Gallopin and Tony Martin, the two Tonys who we spoke a lot about yesterday, finally are reunited. We spoke ad nauseum about them yesterday, but they didn't get to see too much of each other. Special yellow bike as well for the race leader. Tony Martin and Marcel Kittel in bracing. Well, hi, welcome on the Radio Tour from uh, Race Direction Car Number Two. Well, we had some rain at the start of this stage that was due to be uh, rather nice uh, in terms of uh, weather. So, rain at the start, and every single French rider hopes to be in the breakaway of this uh, stage. We are, of course, on the 14th of July. Tony Gallopin wearing the yellow jersey, the French rider, very proud with that uh, yellow jersey. He uh, admitted, uh, however, at the start that uh, he had uh, trouble finding uh, sleep uh, after the amazing day he spent today. Now, will he keep the yellow jersey? Uh, that's the big question mark of the day. He only has a slim 1 minute 30 second advantage, and it is raining on the peloton. Prudhomme is out of the car, the flag is up, it's about to come in, the stage is almost underway. Kilometre zero on Bastille Day, there's 161 to go. It's a mountaintop finish at Le Plans de Balafi and Lotto Balasol defending the yellow jersey. Marcel Sieber goes on the front early to set the sort of tempo that will make it difficult for anybody to move. He will be the man at the front assessing the composition of the breakaway as it moves up the road. He did precisely this a few days ago when Andre Greipel, the German national champion, went on to win the stage and right on cue. It's Andre Greipel who moves to the front and slots in a second position. Adam Hansen it is also in the red colours. Lars Back is the fourth in line from Lotto Balasol. The class of Andre Greipel. There's Adam Hansen sitting behind him. Andre Greipel is the sort of rider that would fear potentially the elimination time on a stage like this one, but he's prepared to go to the front and do what's required for the team. This is Jerome Pinot now for I Am Cycling. Vorkler, attentive, slots into about sixth or seventh position. And Mil Monar in a third spot for BMC Racing. Looking for the breakaway once again. Kevin Retzer at the back after a big day in the breakaway group yesterday. He did a lot of work. 
The reward for Europe Car, they've managed to get their team leader, Pierre Roland, back inside the top ten. Vesta now from Mustana. This is an intriguing move. This is Vaukler in second position, just as we expected from the Frenchman. Tongue hanging out. And Vestra, he's such a strong time trialist, Louis Vesta. His debut in a Grand Tour was the Volta de Spagna when it started in Holland. And he finished just shy of the Red Leaders jersey, which was taken by Fabian Cancellara. That was in the prologue on the opening day. This is Itazar from Trek Factory Racing. Monar is the man trying to make the move for BMC Racing. Breton Sechet, that is Arnaud Girard once again. Second day for him trying to get into the break. We've seen a little bit of him. Good to see him once again. He's accustomed to getting in moves at the Tour. A little calmer at the back of the peloton. It's Jerome Pinot for I Am Cycling, the man who tried to get things started. 20 kilometre flat section before they get onto the first climb of the day, the colder first plan. This is Riblon from AG to R Le Mondial, a man who had a stunning stage victory last year to the top of Alpe d'Huez when they ascended it not once but twice. And it looks as if the main peloton at this point, a large portion of them, are pretty happy with the composition of the breakaway. But a few more trying to scurry across. And here comes Rodriguez. Rodriguez is the second in line of the two riders in the red and white colours. He is hunting points in the race for the King of the Mountains classification. Riblon at the back, he assesses the situation. Vestra just in front of him. Vokla in the green. It's Monar in the red colours of BMC Racing. Gerard is the rider in the white colours for Breton Sechet. It's Irazar for Trek Factory Racing. And for Movistar, it's the former Italian national champion, Giovanni Visconti. We're into the main peloton. We can see number 149. That's Peter Valitz. One of the Slovakians in the race. The other one, Peter Sagan, he's off the front with Rodriguez and Jan Varta and trying to bridge across to the leaders. This leading group of seven, they are working well together, but there's plenty of horsepower on the way. I'm not sure they'd be too keen to see Joaquin Rodriguez make it across and join them. And the Chateau to St. Ulish one of three castles that overlooks this valley. This one dates back to 1435. A great example of medieval military architecture. It was demolished throughout the 30 years war. And you can see the rain is just starting to make its way down. The riders making their way past along the valley. They can't get a look at these three chateaus that sit up at the top of this hill, it stands at around about 528 metres above sea level. A nice view of the valley. A little bit difficult to access now, however. It's been a long time since they've been in use. Race Radio now give us an update that it's a minute and 30 seconds the advantage for the seven litres. With Rodriguez, Sagan and Barta still hovering at the 30 second mark. The local farmers, as always, they really do get into the spirit of the tour. They put on some great displays throughout the race. And the bad news coming in from the finish line is that it is pouring down once again. The umbrellas are up. People have gone scurrying to try and find some coverage. And they've erected a tent to be able to put the finish line down. So they're trying desperately with a fire burner to get the road dry underneath the security of... Well, not quite a tent, but you get the picture. Got a big tarp up covering the finish line to try and get it dry. Riblon for AG Tour trying to continue their good tour. One stage win already. This is Visconti, number 19. 
not the leader for Movistar. That's Alejandro Valverde, the Spanish leader of the team. Thomas Vokler will be pleased. He gets a little bit more TV time. Riblon coming through. Vestra. It is our now for the Basque Country, riding for Trek Factory Racing. They had Fabian Cancellara collect second on yesterday's stage. And now the German national champion, he is in shutdown mode. Slowing that peloton down. The best place rider in that leading group is seven. That's Vestra, the Dutchman from Astana. But he sits at 32 minutes and 41 seconds off the pace. So he's of no concern to the yellow jersey of Tony Gallopin. Who at this point is unsighted at the front of the peloton. I'd imagine that he's probably down the back having a nature break early on before we get into the real racing with the first climb not too far away from starting. The first climb, the colder first plan. It's an 8.3 kilometre climb with an average grading of 5.4 percent. It's classified as a category two climb. So five points for the first rider across the top of that one in the race for the polka dots. Girard, the former junior world champion from 2002. In the white colours of Breton Sechet in his second breakaway of this year's race. And the bad news for Rodriguez and Sagan is they're drifting out. Latest time check holding them at 35 seconds behind. So they're losing contact. Approaching the first climb of the day. I'll get to the bottom of that climb with around about 139 kilometres still to race. So they're just 7 k's before they start the first of seven climbs throughout the third big day of racing through the Vosges Mountains. It's the rest day tomorrow. Can't come quick enough for some. There have been so many crashes throughout this year's race. Red, white and blue, that certainly is the colour of the day. And Race Radio just giving us a time update of 42 seconds, the gap now for Rodriguez and Sagan. You can see the gear ratio on the bike of Louis Vestra. He's riding the big chain ring for now, but you might have noted the size of the rear sprockets at the back. Reports coming from the start line that most of the big favourites for today's stage, so the best climbers in the world, uh, using a 36 tooth chain ring at the front with a 29 tooth sprocket at the back. It's a very small gear. It indicates just how steep this final climb really is. 20% as they approach the finish line. That is the gradient. The green jersey of Peter Sagan. Rodriguez in front of him. Jan Barta sitting on at the back. Jan Barta, he was in the breakaway on the stage into London. That was a two-man breakaway on that occasion. He was in the move with the Frenchman from Breton Sechet. That was Jean-Marc Bidot. Barta proved to be the stronger of the two on that occasion. He was the last one to get caught before it was a big bunch sprint finish. And Marcel Kittel won his second stage of the race. Kittel, so far he has three this year, adding to his four from last year. And the leader's now out to 3 minutes and 10 seconds. This is Jerome Pinot once again from IM Cycling. He finds himself in a very lonely position, a minute and 50 seconds behind the leaders. Dare I say it, he has no chance of getting across by himself. There are very few men in the peloton that would be able to. Start the climb here of the Col de First Plan, which is a climb of over eight kilometres. Uh, they are already climbing steadily up into the skies, and the rain is catching them out again. Seven riders clear, none affecting the overall race lead at the moment. Best placed in that breakaway, Luva Vestra, 32 minutes 41 seconds behind, and he's on Nibali's team of Astana. Long, steady drag this one, second category.
Just at the moment, the seven riders have started the climb of the first call of the day, the call the first plant. Paul, this is uh, Tommy Vockler. We could have uh, act actually predicted he would have got in the move today. Well, Phil, it's Bastille Day. It's France's biggest holiday. They're enjoying the fact that they've got uh, a man in the yellow jersey on Bastille Day. Now, that hasn't happened since 2011, but I think today we're looking at a big tactical move by a number of teams. Uh, Visconti has got into that breakaway from uh, the Movistar. He's a teammate of Alejandro Valverde. Louis Vistra is a teammate of Nibali. Armel Moana is a teammate of TJ Van Garder. And Thomas Vokler, his team made a great performance yesterday because they moved their man Pierre Roland up towards the front. So I think we've seen a tactical breakaway go clear on today's stage. And we're going to have a very, very tough day in the saddle. Well, we've got four first category climbs, including the last climb of the day, which finishes on the slopes of 20%. That's one in five as they come up towards the finishing line. They're also going to be beaten by the weather today incessantly. As we climb, we'll go into the rain, we'll drop away, we'll come out of the rain. This is a difficult day for the Tour de France today. It's the first real test on the eve of the first rest day. Yes, and it's interesting to note, you know, when you think about how much the team works for Andre Greipel uh, on today's stage, they've actually turned it all around, Phil, because they're looking after the interests of Tony Gallopin, who comes from a huge cycling family. This is Visconti dropping back here. I thought he was going to take that cape, but decided he didn't want it. He's going to stay wet for the moment. Hand up in there by Arno Girard of uh, the Britannia team. Buckler is the rider in green, setting the pace. Vesta is the rider in light blue, swung over to the right. It's a nice solid breakaway to start the proceedings, but uh, behind and coming closer is Rodriguez, Sagan and Barta. Now, Rodriguez made his claim for the King of the Mountains yesterday. The lead in the end of the day went to Tony Martin, the stage winner, uh, but Rodriguez, who's lost too much time in this race to win it, has already said, I want the King of the Mountains title. Yes, sir. Uh, Joachim Rodriguez is a big star. You might just have caught a quick glimpse of the team manager there, Phil, for Trek Factory Racing. Well, that is Alain Galopin, and he is the uncle of the man who leads this bike race overall. Yeah, Alain was in tears yesterday at the finish. Rival teams, of course, because his nephew leads the tour, is on the lotto. Uh, but they were seen together, and Alain was having a little bit of a tear in his eye, trickled down his face. Big moment for the Galopin yesterday. Little narrowing there, there he is, a chance to see uh, Alain Galopin. He still looks as fit as when he raced, doesn't he? Big moment, he was also happy too because his man Fabian Cancellara crossed the line in second place, so there was every reason to feel happy yesterday. Yeah, rather a sad story because he comes from a, a, a racing family, if you like, four brothers who are all cyclists, three of them professionals. Alan was in fact a professional for a short while on the same kit team actually as Sean Kelly, the Sem Francois team, and he had a very nasty accident and damaged his middle ear. And after that moment, he was unable to get back his balance, so he wasn't able to continue his professional career. He became a personal soigneur for Laurent Fignon, and since then he's become a very well-known team manager. One thing we've learned since we've spent these last couple of days in the Vosges Mountains is that when it rains, it really rains. It turns ice cold and it really comes down. And now it's soaking the champion of Germany here, and this is Andre Greipel. You've got to say, top man, because uh, he normally uh, goes out to try and win individual stages. But he said it himself a couple of times, and no, in fact it was Greg Henderson, the, uh, the Kiwi, said, we're happy to lay ourselves on the line for Andre Greipel because he always appreciates the work that's done by the teammates. Here, this is a role reversal. He is actually dedicating his early part of the stage to Tony Gallopin, who's in the yellow jersey. And it's a big day for Gallopin. It's not only just the yellow jersey, Phil. It's France's big holiday. Yes, and Greg uh, Henderson, the Kiwi, would have delighted in being in the service today of Gallopin because Greg crashed out on the fourth day. Last man to wear the yellow jersey on Bastille Day is right here. In fact, uh, Thomas Vokler, he looks for the move. Today, though, I'm not quite sure it's totally for Thomas Vokler. I think it's a Europe car plan to try and toughen up the race. So now that gap is coming down. It's all because of the pressure of the man on the front of this chasing group of three, number 21 there. Great climber, Joachim Rodriguez. He's 58 minutes down in the overall standings uh, because he's lost a lot of time in the first week of racing. But, you know, he's coming back from a long, long way uh, down the ladder. He crashed in the Tour of Italy, broke ribs, broke bones. 
and now he's trying to get himself back into form in the Tour de France well over the first uh, week of this race he lost time uh, left and right but now he's, he's moved I think his, uh, his his program to try and look for something else a different goal in the Tour de France this year he starts the day in fifth place in the King of the Mountains competition uh, seven points behind Tony Martin who took the overall lead yesterday after that big long breakaway and Tony Martin uh, I don't think will be able to defend on a day like today because there's a lot of big mountains and there are now uh, all of the points have disappeared it's going to be a, in a few moments time it's going to be a 10 man leading group with one chaser and that's Jérôme Pinot at 340 and the main field now slipping back to four and a half minutes but none of these riders really at all dangerous in the overall classification the best placed rider as uh, they join the leading group in fact is Peter Sagan he is in uh, 39th place at the start of the day and he's looking for 20 minutes and 11 seconds but as I said just a little earlier there's a number of riders in this breakaway group I think are here to look after their teammates interests a little bit later on uh, Joachim Rodriguez tap on the shoulder there saying well done we've made it and that's because I think of the little bit of help that he got for Peter Sagan early on obviously now there are two tactics at play Peter Sagan will be looking to get over the top of this climb with the group and try and get himself maximum points once we go through the small town of uh, Mulel and that's after about 40 kilometers of the stage covered Sagan a great competitor a little bit disappointed in so far he hasn't managed to get himself a stage victory but he's been very very consistent in fact up until stage seven he was the first rider since 1930 to finish in the first five on all first seven stages So a brief reminder of the riders now in this leading group of 10, uh, Giovanni Visconti, that's him there from Movistar, Joachim Rodriguez, Katusha, Louis Vestre in the turquoise jersey of Astana, Peter Sagan in the green jersey of Cannondale, Christophe Riblon, AG Tuar, La Mondiale, Armel Moana, the BMC rider who's in there, Thomas Vokler in the dark green of Europe car, Merkel Irizar in the black of Trek Factory Racing, and uh, Barta who has got in there for Team Net App Endura. So that's uh, the race situation. You can see a massive gap to Pino. I think Pino needs to think about waiting for the main field because it's going to be a hard day of racing. The real reason for that is because they know we're going to have a big day today where we'll see a big shuffling once again in the overall standings. Well, I suppose we must include Jan Bart as well for Thiago Machado because uh, Machado, the team leader of NetApp Endura, he moved up into third place yesterday. I don't anticipate he'd be there once we go through the Alps, but at the moment he had a great day yesterday. Well, look at this, Paul. Peter Sagan, the man we call in the sprints, the man that wins the green jersey for the past two years in the Tour de France, a competition really reserved for the sprinters he's leading up this mountain now oh, I like Peter Sagan he is great uh, here's now Thomas Vogler <laughs> is very keen. well Thomas Vogler is thinking about his teammates who are trying to win this competition he's also got a few points himself he wants to get maximum points we're at the 7% grade but look at the rain coming oh. down and through on the inside comes Rodriguez and he snatches the point but is he going to turn around the corner that was very very difficult indeed but he got the five in the end wow well, well I'm not sure who got the five there because we've got the rain coming down we've got a corner straight after the sprint point look how quickly though that uh, Rodriguez comes up there well I think that's a photo finish on Rita Rodriguez is saying whoops I've got to get the handbrake turn on here to get around this corner watch out for the continuation here though because the rain is pummeling down on these riders and Thomas Vokler enjoys these dangerous conditions these are flood conditions meanwhile because of the pressure that's being applied in the main field riders are slipping back from the peloton now this man is the national champion of France he's no slouch number 121 it's Ar Arno Demar he's a very good sprinter 12 victories to his credit so far this year one of the teammates of uh, Garmin Sharp slipping back. Now, that's a bit of a surprise because that's a Hanye Acevedo, the Colombian rider on that squad. He's a great climber. But, you know, the pressure, I think the pressure there, Phil, as we got ourselves up towards the top of that climb, which is being plied by a certain Sylvain Chavanel, is doing damage already. 
Well, Acevedo there, that's not a good sign losing ground on this first climb. Paul, apparently, he tried to uh, retire three times yesterday, and his manager he shouted at him and made him get back into the race. Uh, so we'll see if he does does make the final crossing today. Well, they gave it to Tommy Volkler, five points, Rodriguez three, and Sagan getting the one point uh, over the top. Well, that was... Uh, uh, sorry, two points, and one point was Christophe Riblon. Yeah, interesting sprint over the top there because it was pretty precarious as well. Now, another, Phil, this is going to be a complicated day because we've got the King of the Mountains, which is up for grabs, but also there's a big battle for the team classification as well. And kilometres into the race today. Sagan got himself third place over the top of the climb. That really, more than anything else, I think was just to make sure that he kept himself at the front of the group. Just a little bit further behind him in the darker green jersey was uh, Thomas Vokler. Now this is uh, the uh, arrière du peloton, the back end of the race, uh, number 216. Uh, well, no, this is in the breakaway, so this is Arnaud Gérard. He's actually been tailed off the back end of the group. It's hard to see uh, going through uh, this incredible rainstorm that is battering these riders and a IAM cycling and uh, Sylvain Chavanel doing quite a good job there because they've started to pull back that breakaway group who got to four minutes and 33 seconds let's not forget uh, a little while back but now it's down to two minutes and 50. Watching the green jersey here, he won this competition the past two years. He's come into the breakaway because there's an early sprint today on the course. It comes at just 39 kilometres, 25 miles in. He's four kilometres from that sprint point and he's literally freewheeled away from the breakaway. The man is class, Phil, absolute class. There's so much rumour going around on the uh, international uh, uh, Twitter RT at the moment on where this man is going to go next year. He could possibly be becoming one of the most expensive riders on the international circuit because not only is he a prolific winner of bike races, he's also uh, quite charismatic as well. Well, his teammate Ted King, who currently is 183rd of the 183 riders in the Tour de France, but has been working very hard on the early roads for this man, is a lot, has lost contact on the climb of the Col du First Blanc. So it's going to be a really tough day for Ted, and let's hope he gets through it and uh, gets to enjoy his rest day tomorrow. Yes, I was, just, uh, I was going through all the social media this morning, Phil, and uh, Mark Renshaw, who rides for Omega Pharma Quickstep, uh, usually regarded as the lead-out man for Mark Cavendish, was saying he doesn't think there was anybody else in the whole field who would, could do what this man did yesterday. And in fact, here he is, Tony Martin, the leader of the King of the Mountains competition. The riders have a nickname for him in the main field, and that is The Beast. Well, he is a magnificent descender. We saw that yesterday when he flew down to the finish yesterday into Mulhouse. And so Tony Martin's plan here is to try and bridge the gap. Well, currently it's two and a half minutes between Leader and Martin. Here he comes, the green jersey, Peter Sagan. He's looking for the sprint competition. He has broken the back of the breakaway coming down the mountain. He doesn't seem to appear to take risks, but he's so much more skillful on these wet roads than the rest of the riders in that break. He's not even going to have to sprint for his points here. Yes, uh, he's been pushing speeds of close to 90, 95 kilometres an hour on the downhill part of the course. That's about 55 miles an hour. And uh, as you could see him getting down into that aerodynamic tuck position, very resemblant of a downhill ski racer. That's to make him aerodynamic at the front end of the main shield field and just to help him uh, recoup parades a little bit but the big problem on days like this Phil is uh, because you're going downhill very fast with a, a temperature of in the 50 degrees Fahrenheit with speeds going downhill of 50 miles an hour you get the chill factor and it actually chills the bones and it's very difficult to get the body going again once you get into the valleys. Well the brake is slowly getting itself back together here Arno Gerard is the man that we keep seeing up front he is chasing and trying to reach up with Peter Sagan Break is reorganizing itself. They're not interested in catching Sagan at this stage because they know why he's gone clear. Uh, he's got a massive lead in the points competition. Already he's got 267 ahead of Brian Cockard. He's only got 156. He's trying to win this competition before the first rest day. Now, obviously, a tight bend here, and they're all very nervous. 
Yeah, they're very nervous because of these uh, weather conditions. I think the reason Peter Sagan has gone out like this is because he's seen an opportunity. He knows he can pull up uh, another 20 points and he wants to build what could possibly be an unassailable lead. He wants to put points into the bank in case he has a bad day later on in the Tour de France. It's a tactic he employed last year too by this stage last year. He also built a virtual unassailable lead in this competition. Well, he's, he's, he's one kilometre to go for his green jersey competition, another 20 points in the bag, he sat up, he's in the distance, he looked over his shoulder so he saw this breakaway coming towards him, now he won't want them to catch him just before the line. Well, I'm just thinking of a word that you uh, enjoy very much to describe Peter Sagan, uh, cheeky. Yes, and he's almost teasing them now, isn't he? Lever Vester on the front left of our picture there, teammate of Vincenzo Nibali. This is Thomas Vockler here. A little bit of reaction coming from behind now. That big descent here by Tony Martin. They had a plan here to bring him. And Kwiatkowski, and that's their plan as far as Martin is concerned. The best young rider in the race in the white jersey. They're trying to bring him across the gap to those leaders. Well, I might have been a little bit derogatory about uh, Reim Tarame a couple of days ago because I didn't think he had the form coming into this Tour de France. He hasn't been given the uh, designated number one in the team as leader, but he's seen this as an opportunity, and he rode very well on this uh, climb last time the race came here in 2012. Now, moving Kwiatkowski is really going to put the cat up amongst the pigeons because Kwiatkowski, although he uh, is the leader of the Best Young Rider competition, Phil, he's also in sixth place in the over overall standings yes well Tarame was a top six finisher when he got to the finishing line at La Planche uh, de Belfi and now uh, they're just holding off Sagan is going to take the 20 points I'm wondering what he will do then whether he'll just take it easy and let the race come to him there's no reason after this uh, to go uh, hunting because the next point are at the finishing line and because this is a mountain stage today those points are greatly reduced so he doesn't really have much interest at the finish well, 120 kilometres to go, that's about 70-something miles of racing. That's three hours in the saddle before we get to the end. Peter Sagan, job done for him, 20 points in the bag in the points competition. So uh, he can uh, sit on the back end of this group, but I'm sure we're going to start to see a big reaction coming from behind. Uh, working the way up the uh, Petit Ballon climb here at the moment. This is the lead group, Jan Barter in a spot of bother all of the time at the back. He was the one that came up to the leaders with uh, Peter Sagan and also with Joachim Rodriguez. But still making progress on them is Kwiatkowski. It's an important move for him. The current king of the leaders and the winner, Mountains rather, the winner yesterday, Tony Martin, Ryan Tarame, uh, Hollenstein and Weiss. Five riders trying to get across. Yeah, but I think uh, many of the teams were right this morning when they started to say that the breakaway was not going to be given uh, too much freedom today because from that four and a half minute gap the uh, ten man leading group got themselves originally it's now down to two and a half minutes so they're taking a serious interest in the breakaway group it also gives a bit of a rest here for team Astana and for team Tinkoff Saxo of Alberto Contador because obviously Lotto Bellasol are going to do everything they can to protect the overall lead of Tony Gallopin who just sits there in about uh, sixth or seventh position because what a day for him I mean it's a tough day to defend the yellow jersey on Bastille day but it's a huge day for him and for France as well they just swung on to the climb of the, uh, Le Petit Ballon which is 9.3 kilometers now to the summit for the peloton two bunches ahead of them one a group of ten and uh, then a chasing group of five with the king of the mountains leader Tony Martin in there big crowd and it's more a diesel engine behind because we're seeing uh, Rodriguez try to get back up to him. This is uh, Rito Hollenstein. He was in the chase group of five riders with Kwiatkowski and this is a hill too far for him. Well, it certainly is and that's because uh, we've got a lot of pressure. You want to try uh, yourself, Phil, just sitting behind no, Tony Martin. <laughs> it might be fairly easy on the flat, like sitting behind a big old motorbike, but once he keeps that pace going and once we get to gradients of 9%, it's a really nasty thing to do. And looking at him here, he looks quite resplendent in his polka dot jersey as the leader of the King of the Mountains uh, classification at the start of the day. But he's never once looked round for any help from anybody else in this group because he's thinking about the help that he can offer to this man, the youngster on his team, Mikkel Kwiatkowski. 
Oh, what a fantastic teammate he is, Tony Martin. He wins for himself, he then gives all of his energies to help his teammates. Now, Rodriguez took a little bit time to uh, change up in the top gear, but he's found it, and he's climbed across to these three front runners. We've now got four heading up the Petit Ballon. Vestre, Vaucler, and right at the back now, we have got uh, Rodriguez himself onto the back wheel of Moignard at the five kilometre to go banner. Well, that's not... I can not see anything with his sunglasses on, to be quite honest, because there's low visibility without wearing dark glasses, but he's going to go for it. Perito got caught last time. I don't think he might have been expecting Vukler to uh, go like he did at the top of the climb, but this time they're riding very close to each other, and he's looking a little bit itchy. Yeah, don't forget, Phil, there was a nasty uh, little corner towards the end, and I think uh, Thomas Vukler refused to put his brakes on as we got closer to the uh, finishing line. Vokler has made his move and so too has Ro Joachim Rodriguez here this time going from the front can Thomas Vokler make it up to his back wheel he's gritting his teeth the man that crosses the line first between these two is the next leader and he's going again but I've never seen a competition in the mountains fought out like this before and it's round another left uh, right hand corner but this time it is uh, uh, Joachim Rodriguez who gets it a uh, tricky old finish because they, they don't <laughs> expect them to be sprinting for point at the top of a mountain. <laughs> I'm sorry for giggling there, Phil, but that is the trickiest climb finish <laughs> I've seen since the previous one. Now, it's rendezvous at the top of the next mountain because this is a good race to follow. Right, a bit further down, uh, 20 seconds have gone by. This is the next group on the road. This is a group uh, with Tony Martin. And uh, seven riders uh, were in that leading group, so there are no points available for Tony Martin. He still leads them across just in case anything uh, happens or anything untoward is uh, reported later on. And so he will now lead them on the descent. So they're at 23 seconds approximately. So now I think we could very well see a rejoining on the descent because Tony Martin and Kwiatkowski will do everything they can. They'll take a few risks. As Thomas Vokler says, right, I like the descent, so I'm not worried about taking a few risks. But as you can see, as soon as they start the descent, these riders uh, very quickly start to put their hands into the, the back of their jerseys, taking on board food as soon as possible. Rodriguez, 10 points, Vokler's eight. So that puts uh, Joachim Rodriguez right up to the top. Now this is another tricky narrow descent here and again on wet roads the riders have got to be very very vigilant unlike the last climb he came down when Peter Sagan was racing for the green jersey points uh, perhaps these boys will not take it quite so quickly. Rodriguez who's crashed a lot of times this year is uh, lying off the back of Thomas Vokler who is an extremely quick descender by the way and races are won in the Tour de France going downhill with great skill as they are going uphill well that was a great move he got the jump this time on Thomas Vokler Vokler in that big gear an unbelievable style sort of energetic the style of Thomas Vokler but you can see there immediately that Rodriguez jumped Phil he got the gap on Thomas Vokler and Vokler was never able to close it down again so they go 1-2 on the road in the King of the Mountains competition now with advantage Rodriguez. Same point score, first six riders over the top of the next climb, which is also a very, very steep first category climb. And it's a case of going down here and then straight up. There's nothing in between. There's no valley crossing. It's just down one and up the next. And as you can see, these roads very narrow, breaking very hard on treacherous conditions around a very, very tight herping bend here, taken with great respect by the riders. Visconti is the man at the back behind Livro Vestra. But again, Thomas Wolf is showing us what an incredibly versatile bike rider he is. Paul, he's off like a rabbit down there. He certainly is. Uh, he's a good bike handler. One of the things is that uh, Jean-René Bernardo of uh, Team Eurocar, as well as uh, Marc Madio of Frances de Jeu, they really believe in making their riders do the cyclocross discipline of the sport during the winter months as part of their training. And I think it really helps your bike handling ability. Well, at least it, it helps you uh, not be scared when you're riding through uh, wet and muddy conditions, as the riders have seen on today's stage Kwiatkowski now is just at 22 seconds I think after a bit of a daredevil descent here and the power of Tony Martin we should see a rejoining at the front end of the race before we start the next climb of the day well to put more firepower in the group uh, Kwiatkowski then put into a good position to gain time in that white jersey competition as best young rider 
as well. Meanwhile, back in the peloton, all of the Lotto boys trying to keep control of the big favourites in the tour in favour of their yellow jersey. None of those riders on the attack up front endanger the yellow jersey remotely at this point of the day. As a look at the back of the field there. finish at La Planche is going to have him finish up amongst the favourites of the Tour de France this year. He personally says he's a little bit sick, but uh, he knows that his teammate is in very good form. Back with Thomas Vaucler. So it looks now as if the group uh, of uh, Peter Sagan is about to make the junction. That'll be a big leading group. The yo-yoing Jan Barter here, he gets up to the leaders, then he drops back. Now he's getting up to the second group on the road. Uh, and they're saying that Tiago Machado, the third rider overall, teammate there of Jan Barter, has had a crash. Well, we're just looking back here, that's him over on the right-hand side. His bike is on the left-hand side of the road, and that crash has happened actually in a straight line. Uh, well, there you go, there's his bike. Well, and he's on the wrong side of the road. The cars will have to give way to get him across the road to grab that bike. He was standing on the right there. Well, he was third overall, don't forget, after his great ride uh, yesterday in the mountains. Four minutes 26, uh, the peloton across to the front group here. Uh, Machado has moments ago crashed. He was seen standing on the side of the road and third overall after his ride of yesterday. The front group, Paul, remains as five men. Visconti, Rodriguez, Vestrom, Wanyar and Vukla. The back group just gets bigger and bigger. It's eight now. Well, I think we're about to see a 13-man leading group because there you have the power of a certain Tony Martin, the winner of yesterday's stage. It's all back together right in front of our eyes here. So we have a 13-man leading group and a man who started the day in sixth place overall. Mikhail Kwiatkowski is in that group. There's going to be a hard chase in the Vosges today. Complicated here is the man who wears the polka dot jersey. As you can see him there, Tony Martin doesn't ask for much help at all when it comes to riding. And he's got a two-pronged position here. He wants to consolidate his lead in the uh, King of the Mountains, or get it back, I should say. And he also wants to move his team leader, Michael Kwiatkowski, away from the main contenders. Well, at this moment in time, he's dragged his teammate into the virtual yellow jersey of the Tour by 26 seconds over Tony Gallopan, because overnight, Kwiatkowski was exactly four minutes behind Gallopan. Well, well, the gap is 4.26 on my computer at the moment. So the white jersey of Kwiatkowski, is it going to be a yellow one by the end of this day? And it's the incredible, unselfish bike riding of Tony Martin that's put Kwiatkowski in this position. And there he is. Kwiatkowski actually uh, went on to social media this morning, Phil, and uh, he said that he and his teammates had a giggle yesterday in the race because when they saw that Tony Martin had a 30-second advantage after about 10 kilometres or so, he, they knew that he was going to win the stage. Incredible. Michael Kwiatkowski now. This young man has tried on a daily basis in front of our cameras. Hasn't worked out for him, but today will it, as he might well be the next leader of the Tour de France. Yeah, but there's a lot of fighting and a lot of racing still to go at uh, the head of the race. So this is rather an interesting situation because the little graphic there with the jerseys on means the leader of the King of the Mountains, the best young rider and the green jersey are in the breakaway, the Tête de la Course. The yellow jersey is in the group a little bit further back. And in fact, it's uh, quite a long way back because that is at 4 minutes and 26 seconds. And we've still got 95 kilometres to go and we've still got five climbs. We're about to start the next climb of the day for the leading group, and that is the uh, Col du Platzevassel, and that's only after 71 kilometres. Leaving... Oh, there's another problem on the right. There's another problem on the right. That's Nicholas Roach. It's Nicholas Roach. He doesn't seem to be panicking at all, Nicholas Roach. He's got his hand up now. The problem is uh, he's obviously... Uh, Waiting, he wants to. They're, they're calling for a front wheel race radio for Nicholas Roach. Well, for him, I think uh, he might be able to breathe a sigh of relief because just looking at the peloton here, that's not a, a massive big chase going on. They're organized, they're all the way across the road. You've got the uh, Astana jerseys, 
in the turquoise over to the right. They'll be looking after Vincenzo Nibali today. There's the yellow jersey on the left-hand side. Ah, now, this is rather interesting because Thiago Machado, according to Race Radio, has uh, come back and he's restarted the race. Initially, Race Radio announced that he'd abandoned, but now he's back in the race. Climbing the cold of Plaza Weissel. Uh, and this is Astana team also in the man with the green, white and red stripe. That's Vincenzo Nibali in his national champions jersey. And they're putting a little bit more pressure on the front here now. Well, Nicholas Roach uh, just having a problem at the side of the road there, waiting for a front tyre. But Race Radio is actually now reporting that uh, Machado has decided that he doesn't want to quit the race and he's got himself back onto his bike. There's well, a crash and, and for Contador. Contador, we're trying to pick up. Our pictures aren't playing with us at the moment, but Contador has crashed here as well. And this must be on the climb where he's fallen. Well, lots of nervousness in the main field, and uh, sorry about the... So, well, he's uh, pretty cut up there. You can see as the, pave, as the pictures start to stabilise, the doctor is up alongside him. Well, that looks like a, a very, very bad crowd. You can see how badly he's ripped up. His shirt is very black, and it looks as if he's landed there. The doctor is uh, looking after the knee. The doctors do a great job in the Tour de France. These are, these are uh, jobs that have to be done very, very quickly because this man has to get himself back up and get back into the race, and he's standing at the side of the road here for a very long time. Alberto Contador was the name on many, many people's lips here this afternoon uh, as a possible stage victor. Right. So the doctor's looking after him. And he looks as though he's saying, come on, hurry up, get this going. Uh, to, uh, that's, a, that's really, really sad. And the peloton continues on the slopes. So this poll happened on the climb of the collar. And you've also heard on race radio, although we've announced the abandon of Tiago Machado, we're hearing that he's refused to stop and he's actually riding still. Phil, this is the Tour de France. Nobody wants to pull out. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, information that comes through during a mountain stage can just be a little bit sketchy. They are trying to uh, bandage up the right-hand knee of Alberto Contador. I wonder if he's he's losing huge chunks of time. Because, I mean, my, my stopwatch here has him stood at the side of the road for almost three minutes so far. Now, it's a long, hard chase to get himself back into the race. And I'm looking up the road. The team aren't here now. The team may not have seen him fall and they're not allowed to ride back towards him if they're called back by the management in the uh, team they could just ride or wait on the roadside but they're not allowed to return now is this mature no this is arno uh, uh the Demar. french champion has gone demar has gone through uh, contador here adjusting his shoes now it looks to me as though he's not a man thinking of retirement well he's not thinking of retirement at all there's obviously a problem with his shoe which is why he's changing it he doesn't seem to be panicking at all you know, it's amazing how lucid a rider can stay in the Tour de France at a moment like this. This is a guy who everybody talked about being the number one favourite for today's stage. And all of a sudden, in the space of four or five metres, he's down on the ground, and that looked like a pretty nasty crash. But, you know, it just goes to reflect, Phil, bike riders are tough characters. But going uphill, it's such a heavy fall, going at slow speed uphill. Now he's away. So, a two-time winner of the Tour de France has got a, a lot of chasing to do on the mountains, but there's still plenty of mountains ahead. Yes, there's a lot of mountains. Just to see him uh, kicking his uh, pedal there, he's back into the cleats. Uh, Contador is four minutes behind the main field. Goes around that corner. We hear the crowd. They, uh, they've listened, a lot of these people listen on the radio at the side of the road to uh, keep themselves up to date with what's going on there. He's got himself back, he's uh, had that right knee bandaged up by the doctor, but he's looking at trying to bridge a gap of a good four minutes to get himself back into the main field. Now, the peloton were not chasing that hard. Uh, there's uh, Jens Voigt on the right-hand side in the black jersey. Astana in the turquoise in the middle, Frank Schleck in the red, white and blue jersey, champion of Luxembourg. Pierre Roland, the second place rider in the Europe car squad there, he moved up uh, high in the overall standings yesterday to eighth overall. Well, that's going to be a long, hard chase for Alberto Contador. I would expect to see them stopped in the road, uh, waiting for him to come back up to them, and then they will try and pace him back into the main field. 
but he's going to have a long hard battle you know Phil I've got him at around about three and a half minutes behind the main good thing that he's got going for him at the moment is the fact there's one two three four They're teammates the order's gone out they've gone back to pace him back into this race this is why you need a team Phil in the Tour de France and it's been confirmed that Thiago Machado has not abandoned the race he's got back on his bike he refused to stop and he's racing don't know where he is at the moment because this group here are approaching four minutes behind the yellow jersey group and they in turn are five minutes behind the leader so a nine minute deficit at the moment for Alberto Contador right in front of him that's uh, Daniele Bernati the other rider in there as well is Michael Morkoff a great track rider a man who knows how to ride speeds of 50 55 kilometers an hour around the velodromes they have all dropped back now to see what has happened with their man Alberto Contador well, this then. is a man who's won the Tour de France on two occasions before he now has to dig deep into serious reserves to try and survive this very psychological blow well, at the moment, the pelotons are five minutes behind the leaders and they are now confirming that uh, about three minutes and 30 seconds behind the yellow jersey is the Alberto Contador group. Uh, so he's now got to try and close that gap. Now, look, he's a brilliant climber if he's not too hurt and there's still the steep climbs of the day. A man of Alberto's climbing ability could close that gap back to the peloton. This is Merkel Iriza. Here is R with uh, Trek Factory Racing. He's just not quite able to stay in contact as we go a little further back down the road. 7.41, so I've now got Alberto Contador at three minutes to the yellow jersey group. And he's now starting to go through uh, past riders who are behind. There's Mark Renshaw having a look, saying, wow, what is going on in the Tour de France this year? Because that's a man we're all expecting to win today's stage. They're not even trying to get onto the slipstream of the Tinkoff Saxo uh, train here this afternoon. You can see Contador's bike doesn't have any numbers on it. He actually had to get a new bike from the team car. He's pretty ripped up, and uh, when he was stopped and being looked after by the doctor, that right knee there was really, uh, really needed attention. It was uh, pouring a lot of blood out of it. But Contador seemed calm, or remained calm while the doctor treated him and waited to get himself properly fixed up before he set off again. Vincenzo Nibali, on the other hand, lost the lead yesterday. I don't think he was too concerned. He didn't want to assassinate his team on what was a very difficult day. The Bleu Blanc Rouge, well, everybody is enjoying the France's holiday this afternoon. Uh, half a kilometre to the summit of the Col de Plads of Arsel. Almost 1,200 metres at the top. Uh, this is the leading group. It's down to 12 riders. Uh, Irizar and Peter Sagan have been dropped from that group to see the other two the Frenchman and the Spanish rider go for the spin and oh very and there he goes Rodriguez has decided to launch it this time grits his teeth and Tommy Vukler has got a little bit closer to his back wheel they are two good sprinters and this is the third mountain in a row these two have gone head to head in a sprint finish Vukler hasn't got it he didn't quite get into the slipstream of Joachim Rodriguez this guy has got a huge pedigree behind him look at that pop goes Thomas Vukler and the gap back to the rest of the group is quite a long way Rodriguez can sit up now he knows he's got himself another 10 points in the bag and he's stretching his lead now over Thomas Vogler he is trying to lay down the foundations of a victory in this King of the Mountains competition Phil after he's lost almost an hour in the overall standings what a great jump he put in yes he's targeted that he will now have 34 points to uh, Vogler's 29 points with that sprint victory the next climb is second category and we'll top out at that with 58 kilometers to go. Uh, Rodriguez re reassessed his Tour de France after a terrible opening week. So Alberto Contador, um, he was on the roadside, I reckon, for a good four minutes or so while they looked after him. Race Doctor did a great job of patching him back together. He had to get a new bike from the team car, a new pair of shoes from the team car as well before he eventually started to uh, roll away and get himself back into this race. This is going to be, I think, uh, I said it just a few moments ago, Phil, one of the toughest days of his professional cycling career. It's the mould from which the best champions come from, though, when they're on the back hill, like Contador is, he doesn't give up, he gets on with the job, and uh, having to come back from adversity, he's got his team with him, and uh, I think he'll make progress. This rider here hanging on at the tail of the peloton just at the moment, he's over the mountain, more or less, 
Yeah, but this is one of those horrible mountains, Phil. Uh, they put a banner up uh, on the yeah. far side of the mountain, and you sprint for the King of the Mountains classification. You think, wow, great, I've done it, and I'm going to start going downhill. Well, sorry, lads. Unfortunately, there's a longer undulation and a bunch of false flats before you actually start the descent in earnest. And I think it's just about at this point here that we'll start to pick the uh, the, the downward incline. Just 1,200 metres they've topped out. That's the high point of the race today, although the finishing climb is not much lower. Uh, and they finish up a, a climb which has its lower slopes, its higher slopes, rather, at 20% as they come up to the line. And at the moment... Although the rain's gone off, although it's not very pleasant conditions. And uh, out on this uh, descent here, it's probably the worst visibility we've had since the race started. All of Team Astana driving on the front for Vincenzo Nibali. Not in yellow at the moment. The Bjarne Ries was in that uh, car just a little while back. He's trying to encourage his uh, team leader, Alberto Contador. That was a very, very nasty crash. He was down for quite a long time. He was looked after by the doctor. little chat going on that's uh, Bjarne Ries We're trying to figure out what is the the big problem with that knee it really was bleeding profusely when the doctor banded it all up coming up there number 38 that is Michael Rogers Ricky Rogers riding a, a great racer he here now is riding as the the domestique for Alberto Contador Contador in his a very precarious situation on today's stage and the way the race is unfolding we've got a leading group of 11 riders uh, which has got a very dangerous competitor in it in uh, Michael Kwiatkowski who started the day in sixth place overall and that's why the hammer is down in the yellow jersey group the group which also contains uh, Vincenzo Nibali Tiago Machado who himself had a nasty crash and uh, the main field are chasing uh, very very hard 267 points was how many points Peter Sagan had at the start of the day but having got 20 points at the intermediate sprint point in uh, Mulel he now has 287 to Brian Cockard's 156 but a lot further down the road this is the drama that we're seeing today it's now down to 440 he's off the back of the yellow jersey group and there doesn't seem to be that fighting spirit to get back in maybe he can't maybe he's really much more injured than uh, we would know these are little bits of information that won't come to us until the end of the day long way on the road and when we picked him up he was being attended to by the doctor and uh, well he's been losing time on that group he lost a lot of time when the accident happened and now he's uh, he, when, the, when he, he was four minutes 40 back at the time he decided he had a, he dropped back to the car he had a chat with Bjorn Aris and I think then the decision was taken yeah not only Phil has he been beaten up uh, physically by that crash you know when you crash you're uh, going down a mountain in uh, conditions like this at speeds of close to between 55 and 60 miles an hour it really does hurt but then mentally when you're thinking of winning the tour it's even harder so 409 uh, that's the gap and uh, the problem is with Team Astana all of a sudden from thinking that their big challenger was Alberto Contador they've got to put their thinking caps on one more time now because Michael Kwiatkowski is a serious man in this bike race and then they give him too much of an advantage they could be really put on the back foot uh, he started the day in sixth place overall and uh, he was around about two and a half minutes behind Vincenzo Nibali but he's won uh, seven races so far this year Kwiatkowski as we go back here to see the car that uh, contains Alberto Contador again there is the confirmation so the two two of the big pre-race favorites of the Tour de France this was the moment Mickey Rogers on the left hand side there he came to this tour with just one thought and that was to steer Alberto Contador around the Tour de France Contador uh, down wounded and injured unable to continue unable to find the force and the power to go forward and make contact with the yellow jersey group but unable to find the force and the power to finish the stage Astana well they've kept the pressure on because they are so concerned about that white jersey of Kwiatkowski up front he's proved all the last nine days he's very very strong he's a big danger for Vincenzo Nibali who wants to get his yellow jersey back at some stage and uh, now it is Tony Martin, the star of yesterday, becoming the star of today as he takes the other rider back into the race and the yellow jersey.
Kwiatkowski started the day four minutes behind at Tony Galapan, uh, but he was only uh, two and a half minutes behind Vincenzo Nibali, and they're very conscious of that fact. And Astana now, you'd think they had the race leader on the team, the way they're driving this peloton right now, and they've flown all the lotto riders away in support of Tony Galapan. And Galapan himself is in trouble, and I think a long way down this line, but as far as we know, he's still on the tail of this main field. But we still have one second category, one third category, and two first category climbs to come, with the finish at the top of the hardest climb of the day. This is a very tough day in the Tour de France. It's Sorry. a very difficult day. I mean, when you just look at the profile, Phil, uh, you take uh, your saw out of the cupboard at home uh, and have a look at it, turn it upside down, and that's what the profile of today's stage looks like. It's up and down throughout the whole of the day. Maybe the first uh, 20 kilometres were the only easy part of the course as they made their way to the start of the first climb of the day. Amazing thing to think is we've had a hard race so far. There's 70 kilometres to go, and there's still four climbs on the menu. And the visibility, well, we're just about holding our pictures, I think, here, because the mist at the high spots is pretty low. We're into low cloud, actually. The wind has got up consistently in the mountains as well. The trees are visibly bending at the moment at the finishing line, where just now it's not raining at all, but it could happen at any minute. These are the men who have been shaping the stage all day as we go back now to Astana, trying to regain a race which they gave away yesterday because they didn't want the pressure of defending today. And here they are, having to attack. I don't think this was part of... Ted de la Course, head of the race, as we continue to head deeper and deeper into the Vosges. This is the second highest pass in the Vosges Mountains. Looking down, the peloton uh, toiling their way up, the uh, Col uh, d'Orléans, as they get to one kilometre to go. In charge with them is a Lotto. And they're still trying to play the part. This is Adam Hansen puffing and blowing here, the Queenslander. Uh, they get a lot of rain in Queensland occasionally because they've had a lot of flood situations around the area in the last few years But I'll tell you what it's a lot warmer the rain in Queensland I think it is this guy though just does not care at all man now, If you talk about somebody who likes riding a bike Phil Adam Hansen has got to go down with a tick right up at the top because this man right, has, He's ridden so many Grand Tours. He's ridden the Tour de France on five occasions But he's ridden all the other Grand Tours as well, and this is his ninth Grand Tour in succession and I that has got to be an incredible record. And he still intends to ride the Tour of Spain to make it 10. Yes, uh, it is an incredible record. He relishes these three-week races uh, each time he sets off. And he's finished them all, by the way, and he was rewarded this year with a stage winner as well in the Giro d'Italia. A marvellous uh, bike rider indeed. Well, Rodriguez has got the King of the Mountains points. He'll go clear now by seven points over Tommy Vauclair, but there's still uh, with double points on the last climb today, Paul. If the same guy won uh, two climbs, they could walk away with 30 points in the bag uh, still to come on the road. I'm wondering uh, if Thomas Vauclair now has decided to try and drive this break and get the victory at the end. That would be much more important to him. Well, let's not forget uh, it is Bastille Day. Just to finish off the little story of Adam Hansen, Phil, uh, this guy decided to come across to, to ride road racing after being very successful as a long-distance mountain biker. Now, in the in the Northern Territories in Australia, there is a, a pretty crazy mountain bike race uh, which goes on for miles and miles and miles. It's called the Crocodile Trophy. Great name, eh? Well, Adam Hansen <laughs> won that race on two occasions. Just looking down in the peloton there, Paul, Team BMC far from out of this today. They've got four to five riders in the main pack there and riding near the front. Haven't actually seen TJ Van Garderen, but he, he's certainly in there and he's looking to make up a little bit of time. We might well see him moving to the fore towards the end of this day yet. Astana still willing to work, anxious at the time gap. Pietkowski still the virtual leader by 25 seconds on the road. And still at the front, it is Tony Martin who continues to set the pace till those legs will turn no more as he tries to keep them clear. Only 36 kilometres to go, but two major climbs to come. Here we go again. 
These are like Siamese twins, these two. They break away together towards the top of every climb. But I think, as we saw this on the previous climb, Thomas Vuckler has conceded the race in the King of the Mountains to Joachim Rodriguez. And I think he's now decided to gamble and see if he can break away on the last climb of the day and win the stage for France. We're looking here at the yellow jersey at the start of the day. It was such a great rejoicing victory for the French to get the yellow jersey on yesterday's stage just ahead of him is Andrew Tolansky who's been on the ground uh, three times in uh, 48 hours just a couple of days ago trying to survive the Tour de France he started the day in 19th place just inside of six minutes in arrears but this is what it looks like just trying to keep the yellow jersey Joachim Rodriguez now seems to have found the legs oh. we could be looking at the gap now between him and Kwiatkowski Rodriguez is going on he's turned his form around after being beaten over the first week of the tour recovering from accident an injury he's now found his legs too late to win the tour but Rodriguez now drives on here as he drives on for the win of the day and Kwiatkowski is just gonna have to try and live through this one this is a very steep part of the climb but not long well it's not long once he gets over the top he can take a few risks on the descent and it's a very rapid descent so further down road you can see the damage third place on the road was uh, Giovanni Visconti this is Kwiatkowski the youngster 24 years of age he's got his eyes fixed on the back wheel there of the Spanish rider in front of him in the red and white that is uh, Rodriguez he's been a great star in the Tour of Spain over the years he's been the Spanish national champion this year he expected to try and win the Tour of Italy which happened in May but he had a nasty crash on the sixth stage a lot of people didn't think he'd make it back for no. the Tour de France but look at this an hour behind in the overall standings but once the roads start to find a bit of gradient he looks at ease as they continue to get caught this is Vice being picked up by the peloton just hoping that the top of this climb comes soon enough so he can try and get back to the pack uh, but he's really struggling today now not surprisingly Tony Gallifan now Nibali is the second rider in our picture here if he finishes more than 1 minute 34 seconds ahead of the yellow jersey then he reclaims his yellow jersey tonight look at his face though Phil he looked calm there very calm indeed as he allowed his teammate to do the pace making he doesn't really have any reason to chase down this man we're looking at Joachim Rodriguez he's looking at 10 points at the top of this next climb of the day and he will really start to move away in the King of the Mountains competition if he gets those 10 points but he wants the victory but to finish what I was saying Nibali doesn't need to catch Rodriguez on today's stage because you know he's so far down in the overall standings but does Vincenzo Nibali today want for pride to win the stage well, who knows? 56 minutes behind, actually, uh, is uh, Rodriguez on Nibali. Now, let's remind ourselves that Nibali was fourth on this stage when we came up here for the first time two years ago. And the riders who were one, two and three are not in the Tour this year. So, logically, the next man should be Nibali. We'll see. Tony Gall... Kwiatkowski slips into third place and there's a little bit of a comeback coming from the man in the dark blue jersey there of Giovanni Visconti. He's had a very, very good recovery period there and he's come back and that's well, that's a little flashback for you. That's how he jumped Kwiatkowski, not interested in helping him back up to the leader and has sprinted away from him on the climb, the penultimate climb of the day. And Armel Moya is also coming back. Kwiatkowski, I think, has blown. Well, it's tough, Phil. Let's not forget he's 24 years of age. Put it into perspective. You start to get a little bit more strength when you get to 25, 26, 28 years of age. Over the summit of the climb, maximum points for number 21. Joachim Rodriguez, another 10 points in the bag for the King of the Mountains competition. He's won five of the six climbs so far today, that man, and he was second on the other one as well when he lost the sprint uh, to Vuckler on the Col de First Plan. Now, we go downhill for a short distance and then we begin the climb up to where we are on top of uh, La Planche and so far no rain up here. Well, Visconti is around about eight seconds behind Rodriguez, but now that we've got over the top of the climb, it seems like there's a little bit of a recovery coming across there from Kwiatkowski. Well, he'll have a little chance to recover, but it won't be much chance to recover when he gets on the last climb of the day because it begins with a... 
it slows a little bit to 11% then it comes up a massive length of it is another 11% and then we kick off with a 20% top it is the most vicious end to an incredible day here in the Vosges these are not high mountains like the Alps or the Pyrenees but they are equally as difficult so third and fourth position on the road of Kwiatkowski the 24 year old from Poland with him is Moana this is uh, the jersey the group of the main contenders that's Vincenzo Nibali just on the right hand side in the turquoise jersey and the Italian flag around his mither Geraint Thomas on the left there for Wales are puffing and blowing but he's still in contact he's just behind his own teammate Richie Port who himself finished well up here a couple of years ago when the race was won by his teammate Chris Froome Garrett Thomas has just got better and better in this year's Tour de France. He had a wonderful day on the fifth day over the cobblestones in the north of France. Here he is now riding with the best men left in this race, right at the front, heading towards the finish. We go to the back. We look at the agony on the face here of Tony Gallopin. At this point yesterday, he was all smiles, knowing just down the road was a yellow jersey awaiting him. He's lived that moment. Now he sees the other face of the Tour de France. But he knows and he even said this himself uh, he wants to enjoy the yellow jersey because uh, in the next few days the next couple of weeks he will be asked to turn around and work for his teammates Andre Greipel and Jürgen Vandenbroek you've got to be you know you have to take risks to get back into the race but sometimes uh, those risks are uh, got to be a little bit more calculated than that one three minutes for the spread back to the yellow jersey group although I don't think we should hold too much confidence in that at the moment because the yellow jersey has been dropped by the main chase peloton Visconti a stage winner of two stages of the Tour of Italy last year is still very much a danger in this race but I think Rodriguez will put in another move on the climb and remember next time we finish on the line so uh, the weaker riders who've got back to him might find they're put on the defensive once the climb starts what a day we've had uh, we're looking still 12 kilometers to go to the finish at seven miles the man who hopes to take the lead again is in second position Vincenzo Nibali he's got Fulsang up alongside him but uh, also he's got Alejandro Valverde in this group going to be precarious Phil it's about an hour one one minute 25 seconds of the distance between the uh, group of Nibali and Galopan but surely Galopan will lose those extra few seconds team team manager trying to get up there and take a few risks there's Andrew Talansky at the back of that group having a tough day with the injuries that he's nursing Back at the front of the main group, uh, this is the group of uh, Vincenzo Nibali, Alejandro Valverde, Ritzy Port is the rider in fifth position. Now onto the main road, uh, bonjour, as they say hello as they go around this corner, that's Visconti. Well, in fact, all of a sudden, the man who was left behind on the climb has said, right, I'm off now, I'm going for it. 24 years of age, this year, Kwiatkowski is Omega Pharma Quickstep. He's sat in the slipstream of his teammate, Tony Martin, and I'm sure he is encouraged by the fact that Martin has sacrificed himself for this young man this afternoon. He's going to take the advantage of the descent. He knows that he struggles a little bit on the climb when it looks uh, as his performance compared to uh, Rodriguez, so he's looking for a lead before the start of the climb. Right, this is the third, fourth and fifth position. Uh, we just had a very nasty little crash on the descent away from the uh, climb, the climb of uh, Chavert. And in fact, uh, one of the teammates of uh, Vincenzo Nibali, in fact, went off the road. And that, in fact, was uh, Scarponi. Then a few moments after that, the yellow jersey almost came unstuck in the same corner. What's happened now is we got a general regrouping of the leading group of four riders on the descent. And as soon as the descent started, Michael Kwiatkowski, he said oh, he's going to take advantage of the descent and try and get clear on his own. Well, Kriakoski Paul here has got away from them. It's desperate moments for him to try and steal a march before the last climb begins. Well, at uh, almost 50 miles an hour going downhill, Phil, what happened was Kwiatkowski managed to come back up towards the leading group, and as soon as the descent started, he said, right, I'm off, I can't rival you guys on the descent, so on the climb, so he's used the descent to go clear of the men that he was with. He now leads the race on his own. Ten kilometres to go, uh, he's through, he's at nine kilometres now. We've got Visconti and uh, uh, Amoyel Moanar, um, who has gone through as well. 
Well, the race situation, uh, Phil, the yellow jersey is a long way off the back. He's around about one and a half minutes behind the group of Vincenzo Nibali. So it's borderline at the moment as to whether or not he's holding on to his yellow jersey. It's all going to uh, uh, come down to how he can climb the final ascent of the day, La Planche des Belles Filles. Well, I'll tell you what, he's taken a few risks there to get back into the convoy, but the cheers being reserved here for Michael Kwiatkowski, who is uh, just on the getting ready now to start the last climb of the day here. He's just before we start the climb. I think that was a good move because to get rid of uh, Rodriguez, it's going to force Rodriguez to have to come back to him now. Probably going through his mind, Phil, is the fact that he's been sitting on throughout the whole of this field onto the tail of his teammate, Tony Martin. He will be inspired by the work that was done by Tony Martin, and he will do everything he can. But let's not forget what happened today. This has been a dramatic day through the Vosges. Alberto Contador, one of the pre-race favourites, crashed and has had to abandon the Tour de France today. He apparently he has said he hit something in the road. He wasn't sure whether it was a hole or a stone, uh, but he went down very, very heavily and uh, is out of the tour. Now, Kwiatkowski has got company again with Rodriguez joining him. A perfect springboard position for Rodriguez because when this climb goes up, I think Rodriguez will go. Well, Phil, just uh, remember when uh, this man in second position, Rodriguez, won his first stage in the Tour de France, and that was in the uh, up to the aerodrome of Mont. He went to beat a certain Alberto Contador. He'd be thinking today of stage victory number two. But he sprinted away from the group to win at Mont at uh, a little airport at the top of a short, steep climb. This is not quite so short. This is a very hard climb of six kilometres, ending at the steepest point at 20%. He's in the ascendancy in the second week of the Tour de France, the second oldest man in the race and still loves these climbs, has a real love affair with the Tour de France. Now, 1.15, it still seems to be locked in at the moment. Only Kwiatkowski, Kwiatkowski is approximately uh, 45 seconds in front of Nibali. All over the bike now for Joachim Rodriguez, uh, while the damage is being done at the back. Rui Costa, number 111, he's champion of the world in the road race. He's slipping backwards, so too is Chris Horner. That's not a surprise, but still now the move coming from Nibali. He's seen this, and the response is coming there from Alejandro Valverde and Richie Port. Well, this is uh, Nibali making his move and stretching it. Valverde saw it. It was in exactly the right place, but he could not issue it. And we've got uh, Thibaut Pino also trying to go in the blue jersey. He's aiming for a high finish in Paris. That was the move. He sensed his teammate could go no more. It's now or never. Can Nibali bridge a gap of a minute and 15 seconds? Kwiatkowski, he's gone right by Kwiatkowski. He could be looking at the victory of the stage here this afternoon. He's Looking at around about 45 seconds, Kwiatkowski has been dispatched. There's only one rider left in front of Vincenzo Nibali here this afternoon, and it is Joachim Rodriguez. He used his teammates throughout the whole of the day, and now he is free to fly. He is looking to get himself the victory. He threw off the bottle there, Phil. He wants to lighten his bike as much as possible. He'll be peering around all of these corners, wondering, can I spot Rodriguez? Well, there's Kwiatkowski. Five days in, we lost the defending champion, Chris room ten days in we lost Alberto Contador the hot favorite to win now the man who set himself up as the favorite in the absence of those two Vincenzo Nibali is moving up to the only man who's still riding ahead of him and that is Joachim Rodriguez Jürgen Vandenbroek slipping backwards with the uh, Rui Costa with Chris Horner these guys all being left behind by that massive acceleration He's still Riblon here, Richie Porter uh, looking for something and he looks as though it is still the TJ Van Garderen there, Perot here, Port and TJ Van Garderen, Bauke Mollema in trouble. Well, as we start to make our way through this group, you can see the damage that has been done. They're slipping away there now as well as Simon Spilak. There is Kwiatkowski. He's gone straight backwards. Number five, uh, Mikel Nievi, the climber from Team Sky. He is also slipping away. 
Two kilometers to go for the lone leader, Joachim Rodriguez, who's been up front virtually all day, being chased by the man for a week who wore the yellow jersey, gave it away yesterday, and he's going to get it back today. And Nibali is now about to see this rider up front. Well, uh, every time he looks around the corner, he will be peering to see as to whether or not he can pick up a red and white jersey in front of him. Joachim Rodriguez's body now, Phil, is shouting for surrender. Stop hurting me like this. But this guy knows that not far away from his a stage victory in the Tour de France, but so does this guy too. This must seem a little bit harder than Jenkin Road in Sheffield, and that was where he took his yellow jersey on the second stage of the Tour de France in the UK. This is a long climb to the finish, and it's at the end of a day of totally long climbs. But can he get up now to catch the Spanish rider? Uh, Roman Bardet is in there for uh, AG Tuala Mondial. Look at that gap, Phil. It is not very much. It's 150 metres. You know, uh, this is going to be very interesting today to see whether or not Nibali can make that distance. It's 22 seconds. It's going to be a tough order. It's just a question of whether or not the man at the front, Joachim Rodriguez, has got anything left. TJ Van Garderen is in this group as well. That is uh, Jean-Christophe Pirot in second position. Roman Bardet is up there as well. AG Tuala Mondial are doing a great ride here this afternoon and such is the way this race reverses if Bardet crosses the line more than 13 seconds ahead of Kwiatkowski he will take the white jersey away from him well 22 seconds behind the uh, leader on the road uh, Joachim Rodriguez he's fighting back from a dramatic crash which saw him exit the Giro d'Italia there oh Phil that's not 22 seconds anymore no. it's five or six that's amazing, and he's got just over a kilometre to go now, and here comes the Italian champion up against the former Spanish champion. He just twitched a little bit, Rodriguez. He knows he's coming. There's a storm brewing on top of La Planche del Belfi. He looks over now. He can. Has he got any legs to pick up uh, Rodriguez? And for the king of the mountains, by the way, it's double points to, on this climb. Instead of 10, it's 20 for the first man up. Well, Phil, the problem is for Joachim Rodriguez now, even if if he can lift it to get onto the wheel of Vincenzo Nibali, when they take that right-hand turn near the top, it kicks up to 20% gradient. You know, it's one of those climbs that if you get out of the saddle, you might pull your front wheel off the ground, it's so steep, but Joaquin Rodriguez has found something special. There's Alejandro Valverde, number 11. There you can see now Look Richie Porter. TJ Van Garderen here. TJ Van Garderen looking comfortable. He's in third position. Richie Porter said, right, it's up to me now. I have to control this. I've got to limit my losses in a situation like this. Port starting the day in fifth place in the overall standings. He could be climbing up uh, quite possibly into second or third place tonight. I think he will, most certainly will because we've lost uh, Tiago Machado, we've lost Jakob Fulsang now, next will be Richie Port. Logical thing is he will be up into second place tonight as we go further down at the groups here. The world champion still here, Chris Horner is still here, but it's all about the last kilometre now. And just uh, as we look here, the yellow jersey is still pushing on. Desperate moments by Tony Gallopan. We're inside, one kilometre to go, and Rodriguez will not lie down. Well, he won't lie down. He's working now with Vicenzo Nibali this is the little flat part before the right hand bend and then it will really kick up they are riding very quickly indeed these guys have slowed down they're giving time to Vicenzo Nibali he's going to consolidate his lead in the over that's Thibaut Pino who makes the move he's a local guy he lives about 20 kilometers away from this area and his uncle is the mayor of the town as well as he tries to make it now look at the attack here that was a clean pair of wheels in one smooth move as uh, now Vincenzo Nibali free to fly to the summit of the mountain today and pull on the Mayo Jean. He let out on loan for a day yesterday. He just goes around that corner as he levels a little bit. He'll hear an enormous crowd. Oh, steady on as he gets around. He, on the upper mountain, he's almost overshooting with pure speed. Now for the two-handed salute, his second stage win of the Tour de France. And for the second time he's won a stage, he's going to claim a yellow jersey. The final kick to the summit for Vincenzo Nibali, who will be back in the leaders, Mayo Jean. You can hear the voice of Daniel Mann just calling him home now, and the crowd bring him home as well.
Well, I'll tell you one thing, Phil, it's an awful long way up to the finish line here in La Bloche de Belfi. The final 20% kicker, then you'll see the banner. Every second counts, it all decides by how much tonight he will lead the Tour de France on a day we've lost Alberto Contador in the same manner as Chris Froome with a crash. Well, he was the third favourite to win, two have gone, and now he's emphasised that point. He gets the victory, no strength to even give us a salute. The battle for second place is on, Thibaut Pino hanging on in there, Rodriguez. We haven't seen as Pino has done a great ride there. Valverde. Jean-Claude Perrault. And TJ Van Garderen over there as well. A good result for TJ Van Garderen today. Well, Richie Port behind him. Richie Port, so all the big boys there. And the man who is really sadly not the winner of the day, but he will be the king of the mountains. But what a ride there, Phil, by Joachim Rodriguez, oh. who's still dragging himself up towards his finishing line. Yes, absolutely shattered, but it's been a great day. He'll be happy tonight when he looks at the overall standings in the King of the Mountains. An enormous lead for him. And Mikel Nieve just coming up there for Team Sky. Uh, uh, once again, uh, the Planche of Belfi has had a, a little bit of a game to play here. There is Rui Costa, world champion, coming forward. Uh, Heimar Zubeldia, Frank Schleck uh, just on the back there in the red, white and blue jersey, champion of Luxembourg. And this should be Geraint Thomas a little bit further on. There's Jürgen van der Broek crossing the line. He's yes. lost himself a minute and 15 seconds. Chris Good. Horner in the pink uh, sleeves there. Grimace on his face, but good ride. Geraint Thomas as well. 122 for Geraint Thomas on the line there, but Richie Port was up ahead of him and might find himself in the top three, maybe even second tonight. Now, at 1 minute 34 seconds, it's just passed on the clock, and that was the gap, so I'm afraid that uh, Tony Gallivan got mixed up in a real storm on the mountains today and has lost his leader's yellow jersey. It's gone back uh, to the man uh, who has worn it for a week already and another hero of the day here, Queer Koski, at one stage the leader on the road. Uh, Lawrence Ten Dam goes over the line, looking the distance though at Kwiatkowski. One stage the race leader on the road, and now, in fact, he has lost his white jersey as well to Roman Bardet tonight. Uh, that's a great disappointment. After everything was going his way, the legs sold out. So here is the provisional uh, stage result. Uh, Nibali gets the victory ahead of uh, Pino with 15 seconds. Valverde crosses the line in third place. Jean-Christophe Pirro in fourth. Bardet in fifth and Van Garder in sixth with Richie Port seventh. Leopold Koenig of Team NetApp Endura, he's in eighth place. Joachim Rodriguez held on for ninth but will be the leader of the King of the Mountains competition tonight. And the other rider from Team Sky, uh, Nieve and a bit of emotion here from the man who thought he could have just held on for the yellow jersey for one more day tough climb and a tough day for tony gallopin so looking down over the vosges <laughs> funnily enough uh, as the race has now uh, finished and spent the majority of the day uh, battering around in these uh, continuous thunderstorms and rainstorms it's uh, a beautiful day in the area of uh, the thousand lakes what a battle we've had today, and I think everybody tonight, Phil, is going to be very, very happy that, in fact, there's a rest day looming on the horizon. Oh, boy, they'll be going to bed with aching legs tonight. The overall classification back on top is Nibali ahead of Richie Port, who has got back into second place, but 2.23 down. Valverde is third. Rowan Bardet has got fourth overall now, and he takes the leader's young rider's white jersey. Galapan goes down to fifth. Thibaut Pino, the French will be happy, he's up to sixth. TJ Van Garderen up to seventh. Jean-Claude Perrault in the top ten. And the world champion, we hardly speak about him, but there he is sitting there in ninth place, Rui Costa. Valka Mollema struggled on the last climb today, but even so, holds a top ten position at four minutes and eight seconds off the lead. With the much needed rest day behind them, the 179 riders remaining in the race go back into battle today. Hello and welcome to stage 11 of the Tour de France, where the journey south has finally seen the arrival of the sun. Still, 
So don't expect to see the crosswinds of the first week throughout today's stage. That will come as a relief to those who are in the race. Christian Meyer on the front for the Orica Green Edge team. They've got one of the big favourites for today's stage. Nissan Gribo, a little bit earlier on the stage today. We just missed it by a few kilometres. We made it through the hometown of Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur, who grew up in this region, he was born in 1822. He is best known for being the man who developed the vaccine for rabies. So an important man indeed. We missed the opportunity earlier in today's stage to go through his hometown, well, the peloton did, but we missed it in terms of the race coverage. So he didn't get a chance to take a look at the statue. It is a chance for that town to celebrate one of its most famous exports. And the main peloton, they are strung out at this point. They're rolling along quite quickly. It was a few days ago into Nancy, and what a dramatic day that was when we saw three of the contenders for the podium in the general classification crash inside the last 20 k's. Van Garderen, Vandenbroek, and also Talansky. On that occasion, Matt White, the director from Orica Green Edge, thought that Cannondale did too much work too soon. Well, today, he is one of the bosses of the peloton, telling his team what to do. Average speed so far, as you can see for yourself, 47.5 kilometres per hour. It has been quick. Cannondale, all in green. And the slightly different hue to his green jersey, of course, is Peter Sagan, the leader of the points classification. He has more than a 100-point advantage. Well, hi, and welcome on the Radio Tour from car number two, just behind the pack. Uh, the official start of this stage at 12.52. Really nice weather conditions. Uh, bright sunshine and fairly warm. It's uh, precisely 28 degrees just behind the pack. We had a crazy start to this stage. The Canadian Christian Meyer got his opportunity to ride the Tour this year as a result of the late withdrawal of Michael Matthews. So it continues its journey down towards the south as we're heading in the direction of the Alps. They're to come in a few days' time. Tomorrow we head into Saint Etienne and then we return to the mountains. Back with the breakaway group. De La Place from Breton Sechet. Good to see them in the move once again. And three of the wildcard teams in the breakaway. And it's the three teams that we've seen so regularly in the long range attacks. Plenty of lakes scattered throughout this area. The Lake de Vera is the one that we're getting the opportunity to take a look at now. Some 1.5 kilometres in length. It's around about 450 metres across with an average depth of some 25 metres. Covers some 64 hectares and currently sitting at around about 520 metres in altitude. So it gives you an idea of the fact that there'll be some crisp air in this region in the mornings, but it's nice in the afternoons when it's at this time of year. The Cannondale team, they'll know what to expect on this stage. Stage 11 of the Tour de France, and there is a breakaway group of three riders up the road. Their advantage now is down to five minutes and eight seconds. This is Andrew Talansky at the back of the group from the Garmin Sharp team. He's had a difficult opening phase of this year's Tour de France, but he's still on the hunt for a stage victory by the time we reach Paris. Good evening to those of you who are down in Australia who are joining the coverage. What a dramatic opening phase it has been to the race. It's been a tough opening week as well for the Orica Green Edge team, particularly with that crash on stage one for Simon Gerrans. Today, though, Simon Gerrans is targeting the stage victory. It's the teammates of the Australian national champion, along with the teammates of Peter Sagan, who are doing the chasing. This is the stage that Simon Gerrans had already earmarked long before the race got underway. At the conclusion of this year's Criterium de Dauphiné, at the beginning of June, Gerrans, along with a few of his teammates, 
they came down to take a close look at this stage. Gerens rode the final 50 kilometres. He'd already declared that it looked good for him on paper. And after riding the course, he confirmed that it was good for him. So he is optimistic about his chances to be able to win the stage today. Chassis for the intermediate sprint. One kilometre before they get there. It's just a small red kite to tease them about the sprint that is to come. Martin Almiger isn't a bad sort of a finisher. He's a little bit like a Simon Gerrans the next level down when it comes to sprint finishes. Not that I'm expecting much of a sprint from this group. And perhaps that's the beginning of the conversation from Anthony Dillaplace and the white colours just confirming with the most experienced man in the move as to how they'll be tackling this green flag. You can see those red flags to come. They're the four categorised climbs, all squeezed within the final 50 kilometres of the stage. The Cote de Rona, that's the first one. That's the longest of the climbs. That's a Category 3 climb. It's 7.6 kilometres in length, with an average gradient of just a smidgen under 5%. And I suspect that we'll see a bit of action once we get onto that climb. 300 metres to the sprint. De La Place it is who sits at the front. Now it looks as if Cyril Lenoir at the back of the group is pretty keen to pick up the points here. And so too is Alminger, so it is turning out to be a little bit of a sprint. Cyril Lenoir leads the charge. De La Place at the back of the group. Alminger surrenders and Lenoir collects the points. I wonder if they're resigned to the fact that they will be caught by the end of the stage, so they may as well pick up the prizes along the way. There's also the small matter of winning the prize of the most combative on the stage, which might be the only prize these three riders really get to celebrate. That, at the very least, gives somebody the opportunity to stand on the podium at the end of the day. Limois, Alminger, De La Place, the three leaders as they make their way across the intermediate sprint point. And I'm looking forward to seeing what happens back in the main peloton. Will Peter Sagan take a leaf out of the book of Marcel Kittel and decide not to contest the intermediate sprint? It's a 131 point advantage he has in the race for the green jersey. So how about time to focus on collecting a stage victory? He has had seven top five finishes so far throughout this year's race, but yet to notch up a win. And the average speed so far, 43.8 kilometers per hour. Slowing down a little bit in terms of speed, but not intensity. The road was slightly downhill at this point, but for the previous few kilometres, it's been a gentle drag uphill. Four minutes and seven seconds. It will start to reduce a little bit as the main peloton approach this sprint, particularly if the Cannondale have got team have got ambitions for Sagan to collect more points. And you can see the other darker green colours off to the right-hand side. Brian Cocker is also making a bid for the green jersey. He sits in second place, but he's smartly continuing to pick up points as the race rolls on. With all the crashes that we've seen so far, Cavendish, Froome, Contador all out of the race, the young Frenchman on debut is riding very smartly just to keep chipping away. Bit of a move coming here from the giant Shimano team. This looks like it's Tom Vilas who's leading out. Andre Greipel now looking to collect some points. Kittel off to the left-hand side. Renshaw is also in the mix. The rider in the red and white colours. That is Kristoff, the Norwegian from the Russian Katusha squad. But look who's missing. Peter Sagan not contesting, saving his energy for later on. Greipel gets it ahead of Kittel. It was then Kristoff in third for the minor placings in the race for the green jersey. Worth noting the absence of Peter Sagan throughout that intermediate sprint. Saving some energy for the final one. Could be a wise decision. So it was Greipel, 
Kittel, then Christoph. The top three across the line from the bunch sprint for that intermediate point in the race for fourth position. And there is Peter Sagan. It looks like he thought about it and decided not to. And good to see Mark Renshaw continuing to fly the flag for the Omega Pharma Quick Step team. Alexander Kristoff, the big Norwegian, all smiles as he has a chat with Marcel Kittel. The vastly different build on the Frenchman, Brian Cocker. And Mark Renshaw, a man of a lot more experience than Cocker, giving the advice. Sneak over to left here, Brian. It'll be a little bit more comfortable. Ulrika and Cannondale, they'll keep doing the chasing. Here is Christian Meyer. He might have thought at one point that his career was about to dry up. So he went from a few seasons at the Garmin team. He didn't get an opportunity at the Tour de France. They didn't renew his contract. He then had a year or two with the United Healthcare team in the US. But Matt White, Norica Green Edge, they gave him the opportunity to head back to Europe. And now he's in the Tour for the first time. This is the higher the percentage, but uh, it would be between 11 and 13 percent, I would expect, uh, on a, a race like today. The current average speed is about 42 percent, so if it sticks at that, he's looking at about 14 percent. But you know, over four hours, that's not very much. No, uh, it's, um, but it'll still be around about 40 minutes, which uh, I think if let's hope he doesn't lose 40 minutes anyway. It'll all, uh, we'll all know the answer in a couple of hours' time, that's for sure. But either way, it's a most horrible feeling to be left alone on the French countryside. He's hurting. You notice how he keeps stretching his back. Um, we'll see how it goes. He's already now two minutes, almost three minutes behind the peloton. And he's still got 67k to go. Well, for once, Phil, you are preaching to the converted because I've actually been in this situation in my last Tour de France in 1985. I had crashed in the early part of the race, but, you know, We've said it so many times, nobody, no professional bike rider wants to abandon the Tour de France. No. And if you can keep riding, you will keep riding. And uh, if you get eliminated, fair, it's all fair and done because you, you've been eliminated by the rules and regulations. But I actually did abandon in the Tour de France once, and that was in uh, 1980. And climbing into that van behind the back of the race, and they rip off your numbers. It's almost like, I'm not sure if you uh, remember the Cowboy series years ago called Branded, when he has his epaulets ripped off and his sword broken well it feels a little bit like that when the referees come and rip the number they actually physically rip the number off your back it's not very not much fun and then you've got to sit there and be driven to the finishing line as well with all the spectators looking through the window to say oh look that one's abandoned yeah yeah well the good news is we're on we're running off this escarpment now and we will do for a little while so Talansky hopefully uh, as we're showing him is now coming up to six minutes uh, take off the three so he's just on three minutes behind now there's a bit of flurry of action at the front here it's a long way down to the basement before we start the first of the third category climbs it is but it's a long climb although it's not a very severe climb that we're talking there the climb de la, la Côte de Rogne as we go through uh, Chazelle it only climbs up about 400 meters but the, the fact is it's one of those nasty false flats and it's one of those climbs where you keep looking at uh, your back wheels as if your brakes are catching on it and the, the roads now that the heat has started to appear here the, the roads will start to be a little bit sticky and it will affect the rolling resistance of the of the wheels on the uh, on the pavement you saw that black jersey of Jens Voigt uh and he's I've now heard him call for his team car, so he must have a problem of some description. He's dropped to the back as we swing to the front to see Cannondale pushing the pace down the hill. There's Voigt stopping, and it looks like he's got a soft back tyre. Well, you see the experience of a real professional, Phil, 42 years of age. Jens has seen everything. No panic. He uh, stopped at the side of the road, waited for the team car and the mechanic to be up alongside him, allowed the mechanic uh, plenty of space to change that back wheel and allows the mechanic to give him a, a brief push to get him going again. The important thing when you do stop and have a mechanical like this is not to be panicked or flustered because that panic gets transferred to the mechanic and then he makes mistakes and instead of having a 15 second wheel change you can have a half a minute or a 45 second wheel change so that's something you certainly don't want yes and the team cars when the sea riders had a mechanical you saw lamprey there just go past slowly to give jens a little bit of slipstream 
uh, because it's a rival team therefore it's very difficult for the judges to uh, issue a penalty now we're seeing the three riders up front here and the gap is now quite a way inside at three minutes at the moment as Lemoine sets the pace at the front we're in the town of San Lupicin and that Rhine now is really flying off this uh, mountain down into the town of Chazal. One of the favourites for the stage is Simon Gerrans from the Orica Green Edge team. His sports director is Matt White, who's out in the car behind the peloton. He joins us now. Matt, how does the stage unfold from here? And what are your expectations of Gerrans? Yeah, I think how it's going to unfold over the next uh, hour or two is uh, I think Cannon and ourselves are pretty content with leaving that gap uh, between three and four minutes before we start uh, a big series of climbs where we can uh, you know, put the, the pure sprinters uh, under a lot of pressure while at the same time reeling in, uh, reeling in that breakaway. Definitely time and Garen. Definitely time and Garen. I think uh, he's been on the mend uh, the last couple of uh, days. He's certainly made big improvements uh, in the last, uh, <laughs> last three or four days. And the rest day hasn't, uh, hasn't done him any harm either. So, uh, yeah, we would like to see a, a, a reduced sprint uh, with Simon at the helm. Inside 60 kilometres now. Team Sky Car going back up. We've heard nothing more on the flat tyre to Jens Voigt, but I think we can assume he's come through the convoy safely back into the pack, especially as the course has been predominantly downhill now. We're getting almost down to the low level before we start climbing. This will be as low as we get now before we go to the finishing line in Oyax. And Talansky continues to ride at the back of the race. His time at the moment, though, is holding around about six, six and a half minutes behind. Looking at the eyes of Andrew Talansky, an outside favourite to win the Tour de France at the start and had a first week which saw him right up amongst the leaders, then came the crashes, now comes the pain from those crashes. Unhitched today and with a really difficult last 40 miles of this race today, Talansky is in his own race now, Paul, to beat the time cut. Yes, it's definitely a race of survival for Andrew Talansky, who started the day in 26th place in the overall standings. But I think after winning the Criterium de Dauphiné uh, early on this year, people started to think of him as a top five finisher to uh, confirm his 10th place finish last year at his first attempt. And some people were even saying there was the possibility that he could be regarded as a podium finisher in Paris. He wants to continue because this is the Tour de France, but it's a tough day to uh, be off the back by yourself, especially as we're going now into the hard phase of today's stage yes and the three leaders uh, well the team manager of uh, Eddie Senior of the I am cycling team say that they need four minutes advantage with 50 kilometers to go if they're going to stay away I don't think they're going to have four minutes of 50 kilometers to go I think that's very generous I think they need six or seven minutes because uh, the last uh, 60 kilometers are very very difficult uh, that's why Simon Gerrans looked at this stage uh, after the criterium de Dauphiné because he knew it was going to be a challenger stage and if he's not if he has recovered from the injuries from that first day crash it's an ideal terrain and an ideal uh, finish for him now we're only right down to a new uh, first time ever finish for the tour in Oyenax today and then uh, if you wanted to it's not a very long journey to go back into Switzerland so we can expect we could expect the Swiss riders to ride well today Elmago was the man that went out for it at the start this morning one Swiss rider had already gone home on his rest day Fabian Cancellara had an excellent first 10 days of racing he said he could have done better, but even so, he didn't win a stage, but he was certainly prominent. He had a second-place finish, and the reason he stopped was because he wants to prepare for the World Championships in Spain in September. And I think at the moment, Paul, his form is absolutely superb, uh, and uh, it must have been a hard decision to leave the Tour when he's riding so well. Yes, I think that's important as well, Phil, and uh, he has got good form, but he did say that he'd had 59 days of racing before he went into the rest day, and that's a lot. Yeah, he's a brilliant time trialist. Uh, he actually won the National Swiss Time Trial Championships of this year for the ninth time. And uh, I think he will be, uh, he really has always dreamt about trying to win the World Road Race Championships. Uh, in fact, a couple of years ago, he was so very close. He won the, the World Time Trial Championships and then uh, he was beaten into second place 
when he was racing in Switzerland. Now, this is quite interesting because now we're seeing a situation where uh, Garmin Sharp are coming up to the front. Now, Garmin Sharp, now they've got a, a, a two-pronged attack here. They, they've got to think a little bit about their man, Andrew Talansky, who's off the back. He's continuing to lose huge chunks of time because I've got uh, Talansky pegged at now uh, more than five minutes behind the main field. But this, again, is the sort of stage that could suit uh, one of the youngsters on their squad, uh, Tommy Elder Slachter, who we saw ride very well in the Santos Tour Down Under. In fact, the first time we really saw him, we didn't know who he was until he leapt out of the pack and went himself a stage into Sterling, and he went on to win that race overall. So that could be the reason why they're thinking today they are quite happy to come forward and do a little bit of the pacemaking. There is Sven Toft, there is Simon Gerrans, and there you can see he's got the Australian National Champions jersey on his shoulders. They uh, lost a rider the other day, uh, Matty Heyman, participating in the Tour de France for the first time. It's, it's such an amazing thing to think about Matty Heyman, who's been a professional bike rider for such a long time. In fact, he turned professional back in the year 2000 and getting his first crack at the Tour de France at 35 years of age, or 36 years of age. And uh, I think maybe it'll be a little bit of re revenge for Orica Greenedge. And the way Simon Gerrans was looking there, Phil, I, I think he's up for it. He's pretty much announced the fact, but... Uh you know, these hills, we're going to see attacks. Now, we've got four climbs. We start with the third class as we climb of uh, Oronia. Uh, then it comes another third cat climb. Interesting one, coat of shoes. Isn't that cauliflower in French? It is. Cauliflower it's, climb. Uh, Chou fleur is cauliflower, but <laughs> shoe is actually a very nice little pastry. OK, and then onwards we go. Fourth category and then a final third category before we descend down to the finish. Very, very rapid off the, off the mountains into the finishing line in Oyenax. It's going to be really interesting these last uh, 40 miles or so of the race today. And th there will be a lot of people in this race now, Paul, a lot of riders who feel they can take advantage of the way this race is developed, has developed over 10 days. There's chances for them to succeed now. There's certainly, I'd just like to correct you, it's probably not very interesting if you're sitting in that back long line of riders there because you are struggling <laughs> today to stay in contact with this race as we look down on the River Bien, but the French are starting to feel quite optimistic. You've got to go back almost 30 years to see four Frenchmen in the top 10 at this stage of the Tour de France, so they're obviously very much on the crest of a wave, and they're all youngsters coming up uh, through the sport now in France apart from Jean-Christophe Perrault who's 37 years of age the rest of them 22 23 24 years of age so they have got uh, a lot of racing to do we're on the start of the climbs. these are the approaches now to the climb of the Côte de Rogne and straight away Anthony Delaplace has been unhitched to here from the other two riders Elminger and Le Mans. Don't, don't let us forget now Le Mans was the early leader in the King of the Mountains he'll have no fears of these climbs no, he's uh, shown great form. In fact, he was quite high up. This is damage at the back. Andre Greipel slipping away. This is exactly what Team Canada were expecting to happen, Phil. The Marcel Kittles of this world, the Andre Greipels, the big, strong sprinters to get eliminated through this uh, reasonable uh, uh, continuation of the false flats. And we're going to see a lot of this now. This is a very, very hard final ride. We've got 52 and a half kilometers still to ride here. And straight away, off the back of going riders, we wouldn't have expected to see throw the towel in quite so early. Here's Marcel Kittel slipping backwards. A little bit further up there, wearing number 77 is Mark Renshaw. So These boys have made an early decision just to ride home, haven't they? Yeah, just to survive on a day like today, just slipping away there for Orica Greenedge is Christian Meyer, the Canadian. I did a fair bit of work though for his teams. Well, interesting to know that the man who did uh, make the move there a little bit earlier on from the front of the peloton was the man we expected to see go on the attack, and that, of course, uh, Tom Yelta Slachter, but a lot of excitement even further up the road now because we're down, now down to a single leader, and it's Martin Elmiger. Well, the Swiss champion is a very good climber. He's another man who's won the uh, famous Santos Tour Down Under in Australia, and he's a very good rider. Nicholas Roach here is also starting to put matters to right for Tinkoff Saxo. 
Yeah, well, I was expecting to see a move come today, Phil, from uh, Nicholas Roach or even from Michael Rogers, the Australian, because uh, now that they've seen the abandon of Alberto Contador, all of a sudden they realise that uh, they've got to change the tactics completely around. They, they can't work for anybody anymore, so they've got to look for individual stage victories. Roach has got great form coming into this race because he was recently a winner of the, the Route du Sud, which is a tough race uh, leading up to the start of the Tour de France. So he will see this as an opportunity for him now to fly and ride for his own account and look at this now in the peloton it's the team of Nibali who's had to take up the running uh, just to keep the lead in a safe position none of the riders near to him in the overall classification have attacked uh, so this is fairly routine at the moment on this third category climb of the Cote de Rogna as we see there Vasily Kirienka dropping off the back as well so Sky has lost one of their workhorses and this is De La Place gone right through the peloton after that long breakaway he's been dropped by the field now and this is a relentless tempo which is coming off the team of uh, Vincenzo Nibali well they've been in the wings if you like up to now Phil they've left, uh, left a lot of the pace making to be done by team Cannondale and team uh, uh, team Orica Greenedge but all of a sudden it was Garmin Sharp as we started to find the early slopes of this climb who tried to set something up for their man Tom Yelter Slachter the gaps are coming down pretty dramatically and quite quickly it's 47 seconds now to Slachter and Jan Bakkerland and in a group behind you've got uh, Nicholas Roach there's the face of Andrew Tulansky as well sadly persuaded to continue after he sat on the roadside for almost four minutes the South African Robbie Hunter uh, has persuaded him to continue for the finish Well, Vincenzo Nibali, just uh, given the word out to his teammates, uh, set the pace making, let's see what happens. I can see also sitting in the wings, uh, Team Sky looking after Richie Port. One kilometre now to go to the summit for the Swiss national champion, Martin Elmiger. It's as close as we get to Switzerland now, and this is uh, Nicolas Roach here trying to get across, because this team now is only going for stage wins, having lost Alberto Contador uh, two days ago. Well, that's Cyril Lemoyne who's about to get picked up. Uh, Jan uh, Bacalans uh, is just in front of him with Yelta Slachter and Nicholas Roach and he came across there very very quickly indeed just checking everybody out here at the moment they're all sensing there might be a chance here now there's four riders in the counter-attack which includes Nicholas Roach, Jan Bakalans, Tom Yelta Slachter We keep on switching some 12 minutes down the road now, 13 minutes at the oh, 14 and a half minutes uh, to see Andrew Talansky. He's riding just in front of the broom wagon, the voiture ballet, the last vehicle in the race, who is waving to sweep him up if he retires, but he'll think he's going to retire. This is the leader at the other end of the field, 15 minutes ahead, taking a drink as he comes up towards the last few metres on the top of the Cote de Rogna. He's not interested, Elmiger, in the King of the Mountains. He's interested in the finish, which is now 47 kilometres away. It's going to be a tough day there, really, Phil, for him to uh, hope to survive. There's no response as yet as they try to uh, get an idea of who's going forward and who's dangerous. And for Team Astana, they don't have to chase everybody down on a day like today. They've got to keep a very close eye on certain riders. I'm sure they've got guys like Roman Baldet, the Frenchman, uh, in their sights. They've got uh, Thibaut Pinot in their sights. And, of course, Richie Port and Alejandro Valverde. So they can actually allow a bit of freedom to other riders to go off the front and try and get them themselves an individual stage victory well the two points for being first over the top of the run you're certainly going to go to the Swiss champion here because there's the banner just up the road as Elmiger comes up to the top of the first of a series of climbs now he gets two points but more importantly he wants to stay away and he's only got a lead of 69 seconds on a group containing Nicholas Roach Yes, this is that group at 40 seconds. There's Nicholas Roach. He's now given a bit of freedom. There's Tom Yelta Slachter, Cyril Lemoyne, who was in that early break of three riders. He's just been picked up by these guys. They're not too far from the top of the first third category climb. They'll have a false flat, a plateau over the summit of there, and then they'll start to line up uh, in seven kilometres time for the Côte de Chou. Now, these riders are not at all dangerous in the overall standings. The best place rider, in fact, is uh, Jan Bakalans in the black and white jersey 
of Omega Pharma Quickstep. He's in 18th place overall. And so uh, Nicholas Roach was, uh, in fact, he handed his bicycle to uh, Alberto Contador yesterday, initially when uh, Alberto Contador had his first accident. And then uh, he had to get, uh, he actually stood and waited at the side of the road for Contador to get uh, medical treatment from the doctor at the side of the road, waited for Contador to get back on his bike and then tried to pace him into the event until 10 kilometers left later. The Spanish rider actually abandoned from the Tour de France this year, the former two-time winner of the event. So now Roach and of course Michael Rogers from the same team have got a certain amount of freedom the main field of the yellow jersey and Vincenzo Nibali they went up almost one minute faster than the man on the road this is an interesting uh, counter move here it was four riders it's now down to two Nicholas Roach in the lime green jersey there of uh, Tinkoff Saxo Bank with Jan Bakalans who was aware of the yellow jersey in the Tour de France last year wow. when we were in Corsica and they've seen this as a good terrain now both of those riders are a long way down in the overall standings although Bakalans is only looking for 18 minutes at the start of the day and I would uh, be interested to see whether or not they've been given a little bit of freedom it's another brilliant tactical move whichever way you look at it by Amiga Farmer Quickstep as they try again you can see Talansky there with his head bowed he's determined to go on apparently he told Robbie Hunter that he wanted to continue and Robbie said it's your call it's your body you know how you feel uh, and you make the decision so I want to ride well, I just did a quick calculation. Uh, the rules, Phil, uh, when it comes down to elimination are it's a percentage of the winner's time. Now, it depends on the average speed as well. And currently, it's hovering between uh, 13 and 15%. Now, quickly, if they finish this stage in four hours, that's going to be anything between... Uh, 33 minutes and 38 minutes he's got to finish behind the uh, winner of the stage but you know what he's already 15 minutes behind it's it's a long thing to but i can understand the courage of the man at the back of the race he doesn't want to abandon the tour de france and if they kick him out for finishing outside the time limit fine that's his way out of the back door but you know it's such a tough event to abandon him Absolutely, and maybe they'll do what they did to Tiago Machado and put him back in the race because of a particular display of courage. Uh, and he's got to, he's got to find out. That's all he can do. Not too far away from the top, from the bottom rather, of the next climb, the Cote de Chou. Uh, Martin Elmiger is a very very good man. He quit for this breakaway. Oh, steady on there. He didn't go into that corner at a right angle at all. He sorted himself out because it wasn't wet. Well, this was the feedback we were getting from uh, a lot of the local riders, Phil. Uh, these are very narrow roads on the running down towards uh, the last 42 kilometres or 26 miles of racing. And a breakaway would have the advantage, although I'm not sure Elmiger has the advantage because he's been at the, in the lead since uh, 27 kilometres into the race, which is about uh, 17 miles. And I think it will start to weaken towards him, but it does give the advantage to a guy like Nicholas Roach behind, who's a lot fresher. So it's 30 seconds. The gap and uh, Bakalens just looks over his shoulder. I think he realizes he wants the power and the assistance from Nicholas Roach, who you've got the Irish flag up alongside him. His dad was the winner of the Tour de France back in 1987, and he spent a bit of time talking to dad yesterday over the rest date who uh, probably was giving him a few words of advice and some inspiration. He's got great form this year as well, uh, Nicholas Roach, just recently winning the uh, Route du Sud. Now back with the main field, the reaction now is coming from Orica Green Edge. Obviously, they've seen the move, they've seen the, the setup by Garmin Sharp, who've uh, launched their man, Tom Yelter Slachter, off the front, although he's not on the right wheel currently. And that's why I think all of a sudden they've decided to come and put themselves back into the mix. As we start, uh, as is the case uh, with Talansky, the Cote de Ronya, this is a tough climb for a man in difficulty. They're throwing everything at the leader, and uh, now they're officially saying 21 seconds here, and Nicholas Roach wants to get up there, and Jan Bakerlens, another good move by Omega Farmer Quickstep. Cyril Gautier has just, I think, been brought, uh, brought back into the pack uh, by the Nibali Bunch. Well, that was an interesting move by the riders from uh, Europe Car. Let's not forget there is one lone leader currently, but his lead not very much at all. The Swiss national champion, uh, Martin Elmiger, he's there in that red jersey with the white cross on it. At about 20 seconds is Nicholas Roach and uh, Jan Bakalens. Herada is 
coming across from Movistar and he is still I think is with the Gauthier from Eurocar but again they're only 50 or 60 meters off the front end of the main field oh, that was a nice, nasty, nasty little turn it, yeah, yeah. But I did say, Phil, that what we heard from uh, the riders from uh, Orica Green Edge and some of the local riders who know these roads are they are very narrow indeed. Great racing roads. And because, fortunately, we don't have a massive big peloton, they're uh, reasonably safe to race on. Well, this is another very difficult climb here. He's not far from the top of the climb of the Côte de Choux. And welcome to Shu. as uh, this is the peloton. Going to go around that nasty little kicker we've just seen, Martin Elmager go around he's now can't be far from going under the banner there is the banner so he gets the points he's not chasing the points he is chasing the finishing line today so that's another two points in the king of the mountains but uh, as i say he's not worried about that no he's not he's a long way down let's not forget uh, joachim rodriguez the spanish rider leads that competition uh, nicholas roach goes over the top in second place for a single point ahead of jan bacalans these guys i don't think are concerned about these meager points that are available for them the most important important thing Phil is to try and get themselves a stage victory this looks like Peter Stettner for BMC comes from a very famous cycling family in the United States that was just a little move there to uh, get himself off the front he'll cross the top of that climb in fourth position no points but more than anything else just a show of force for team BMC just sitting there um, Vazi Betty well I'm not sure who Betty is but anyway just scrambling on to the back of the group over the top of the climb there is the uh, Canadian national champion Sven Tuft he's a tough character Tuft just getting on the back there as we look at the two chases well they're running along a little bit of a plateau heading to the next small climb but the spread of the race now to Talansky 17 minutes and 37 seconds and the two chasers are now about to close in on Martin Elmiger Mandel though are the team that obviously are thinking very very seriously about the individual stage victory Jan Bacalans uh, only 18 minutes behind overall, the rider in black having a very good Tour de France. The two chasers are about to make contact, so Jesus Herrada and Cyril Gauthier will make it five. If these five can just combine their energy, there's every chance they might pull away because after the fourth category climb, they will then go downhill and up the third. On the 11% section of yet another climb here in the Tour de France, at one after another, there's almost five riders together now. Cyril Gauthier and Jesus Serrada is chasing, and they're close to catching up with Nicolas Roche and Bacalens, and the man who's been setting the pace virtually all day, champion of Switzerland, Martin Elmiger. But the spread between yellow jersey, the pack we're looking at here, and the leaders is just 30 seconds now, while poor Andrew Tolansky is timed at 18 and a half minutes. Yeah, it's a tough ride for the uh, the lone figure at the back of the race. And now we're looking here, Phil, it looks as if it may well all come together. The gap, as you said, 34 seconds. That's around about 500 metres. There are the two, two chasers. Herada and Gauthier are two very strong riders. And if they uh, formed alliances at the front of five riders, they're going to put a bit of pressure onto the front end of the main field. But every time we see the main field, it's those lime green jerseys of Cannondale. They really want to try and set this up today for Peter Sagan. And they're achieving it just at the moment. This is a long climb, this Cote de Choux. It's over three kilometres, but in fact, it is only given a fourth category tag. And uh, Cote de Desertins, sorry, we've been off the shoe now. And it's only a fourth category tag, which is which is rather surprising because they seem to have been going up for absolutely ages. Here's the coming together anyway as Nicholas Roach continues to apply. Meanwhile, just coming to the top of the Cote de Rogne here and some 18 minutes back. Yes, well, uh, 18 minutes in arrears, and as I said, Phil, uh, again, I've just calculated roughly the uh, elimination time could be between uh, 33 minutes and 38 minutes on the uh, the winner's time, depending on the final average speed of the stages, uh, because uh, it's going to be uh, touch and go, I think, for Andrew Tolansky. These guys are around about a kilometre to go to the summit, and then they will get just a little bit of respite before the uh, the final climb of the day. This is the top of the Desertin. One more climb to come. It's third category. It's apparently extremely hard. It's not a hill that's been used in the tour before. 
as it's Elminger goes over the top in front. So he's won all of the climbs uh, so far. And it only gets one point, so nothing the second place there over the top of the climb. And there's the peloton, hardly anything in it now as they pack the whole road here now. Cannondale is sensing they might have something. Geraint Thomas there uh, snatching a bottle as well, another man for the day. Richie Port, his team leader now, accelerating on the right under the banner and has come right across the road because he spotted a bottle, has he? He's looking across now. Yes, there's the bottle, thank you. And there is Simon Gerrans, looking very good. He's got uh, reasonably low gear and he's ticking those pedals over quite comfortably, sitting at near the front of the main pack. Right, this is uh, further back now. This is Matteo Tosato. Another one of the older riders in this race. This team now, uh, Tinkoff Saxo, have got to figure out what they can do in the Tour de France. They've obviously turned away from thinking about supporting Alberto Contador, who has now been uh, evacuated to Madrid. In fact, interesting story. In fact, uh, the Real Madrid football team uh, used uh, their contacts to get himself into, into the hospital uh, rather quickly to get himself looked after and get that MRI scan, which revealed a, a slight crack in the right tibia. And uh, Contador himself thinks that he might be able to get back within uh, three weeks uh, so my uh, fingers crossed for that I think three weeks Phil is just a little bit too much time to think that he might participate in the Vuelta a España but bike riders are always made of stern stuff and it amazes me sometimes how they can bounce back absolutely it's a surprising and unpredictable tour I think they should quite frankly and again, they're, well, the tails are up of Cannondale now, and they think finish off this breakaway of five, and then Peter Sagan is going to be in with a real chance down in Oinax. Now, the last climb is a, is a tough one, and there's a small descent, another climb uncategorized, and then a long plunge down to the finishing line. Talansky is still holding inside 20 minutes behind the race, so he's, at the moment, Paul, riding pretty much the same speed as the peloton. Yeah, well, in fact, uh, there's a bit of information coming through on the uh, on the, the race radio saying that, uh, in fact, it was the team manager, uh, Robbie Hunter, was asking him to uh, to, to pull out of the race. And uh, Talansky himself said, no, no, he wanted to continue. He really wanted to get back on his bike and finish the stage. They sat and chatted to him for quite some time. So I have to say that that's courage. And that really, to me, is part of the image of the Tour de France. That's what the Tour de France is all about. It's because it's such a high point of a rider's career that you certainly don't want to go out through the back door. Well, the South African hunter crashed out of the last two tours he competed in and uh, never got to the finish of either of them, so he knows exactly how Andrew Tolansky is feeling. He spent four minutes sat on the roadside talking, and Tolansky says, I want to go on. So he took his bike, and he's still riding in the tour at the moment. Peloton uh, being charged down here. Orica Greenedge also feel they can deliver the winner today. And so that man just to the yellow sleeves going around the corner is Simon Gerrans, a possible winner today. So back with the leaders now. Uh, 27 seconds. There are two teams dedicated to uh, nullifying this breakaway, which is now the five riders who have uh, consolidated themselves at the front. Jesus Herrada of Movistar, Nicholas Roach of Tinkoff Saxo, Jan Bakalens, Omega Pharma, Quickstep, Cyril Gauthier, Europe Car, and still Martin Elmiga of IAM. But now it's Orica Greenedge and Cannondale doing the pacemaking. They're obviously, they've got the nod from their man, uh, of course, Simon Gerrans, Australian national champion, but I still feel they've got a, a little bit of a crack with Michael Albacini, but uh, Gerrans has been riding quite consistently towards the front end, hovering around about 10th to 15th position, so he's obviously got pretty good legs this afternoon. A little bit of a chance just to see over here as we go down, not too far away from the race route. Uh, this is the, uh, the Prairie de Echelon, the monument to the Allied wings. Allied forces, and this is uh, from uh, in 1944. The Prairie of uh, Echelon was a theatre where there was uh, 
A massive big uh, daylight drop of arms and ammunition uh, supplied by the Allied forces. More than 400 tons of materials were dropped at 3 to 4 o'clock in the afternoon through three successive waves of Boeing B-17 Flying Fortresses uh, dropping ammunition for the special operations services on the ground. That's the British rider Simon Yates doing the work at the moment for the Olica Green Age boys getting strong as the tour goes into its second phase in his first Tour de France he's the youngest man in the race meanwhile this is Cyril Gauthier puffing and blowing at the front they are certainly not giving up with the idea they might survive it all goes down to the last climb we're still going downhill at the moment we are closing in now on the final climb of the day which is a three kilometer climb average gradient of about seven percent the Côte de Achillon. Yes, it's a, it's a longer false flat, if you like, and once they get over the top of there, there's one other little climb which is actually not categorised at all as they head over the top of uh, the Lac Genet climb, and then it is downhill very, very quickly for about seven kilometres or about four miles. If they've got a minute over the top of that last little ascent, they've got a chance of getting the victory this afternoon, but the, main, the way the main field is going, it's going to be a tough call. because this team, uh, the Cannondale team, have been very, very dedicated to their man, Peter Sagan, and he leads the point competition by 290 points to 164 points, and that is a Brian Cockar, the Frenchman, in second position. Marcel Kittel is in third, uh, Alexander Christophe is in fourth. As we get a chance there to look down at the small town of uh, Mirbel. It's a small little hamlet uh, in the new region of uh, Zero One. Uh, zero one is uh, the department of the N, and we're about uh, two kilometres now from the start of the Côte de Chaillon. There's the town hall. And the Mary, there is the main field. It's still 20 seconds. 20 seconds is about 300 metres. It's twisty and turny now as we go through the next part of this course. So for a while, that leading group of five riders will be out of sight of the main peloton. And isn't this a beautiful part of France? As I said a little earlier, we uh, started uh, off today in the region of the Dubs and the Jura, and now we're into the N. As we see now, the, the poor old last man on the road, Andrew Telansky. He's under the spotlight this afternoon, a man who finished in 10th place overall last year at the Tour de France. Telansky is a rider who hails from uh, originally in Miami, Florida, although uh, he nowadays lives in uh, Napa Valley in California. And here he's uh, just trying to keep in the Tour de France. As I said, having finished, this is only his second participation. He's 25 years of age. He does not want to go out of the back door. Back with the five leaders. 19 seconds is the advantage. Yes, sir. Well, Peter Sagan will certainly feel want to finish it off here this afternoon. As I mentioned just a little bit earlier, he set an incredible record uh, this year, a record dating back to the 1930s by not finishing outside of the uh, first five on the first seven stages. But that's not the kind of record that a man like Peter Sagan wants, Phil. He wants to win an individual stage. Little acceleration now coming from Nicholas Roach. Three kilometres to go on the Côte de Chalon and we just caught a glimpse of Nicholas Roach launching an attack from the front group of five and there he is, he's being chased back by Jan Bacalans and Jesus Herrada. They're trying to come back together, these are desperate moments because the yellow jersey group, which is being led all of the time by the Cannondale squad and trying to get Sagan into the mix, is only 17 seconds back. Martin Elmiger must be feeling very, very tired at the back of the group. He's been out front for virtually all of the day. You know, Nick Roach on the front there in that fluorescent jersey. He really is a class act, Phil. He finished fifth last year in the Vuelta Espana. Elmiger's job done for the day. You know, you have to hand it to him. He was in the break from the 18th mile or the 27th kilometre. And when the lights go out on a stage of the Tour de France over roads like this, there's really not very much more you can do. Uh, no, we saw it uh, the other day with Tony Martin, worked so hard for his teammate and then cracked. 7% the climb, Cyril Gauthier has taken up the pacemaking here. 
trying to stay away from the group which continues to hold them at 17 seconds but can't catch them Gautier, can Roach react to this one? Bacalance and Harada just behind. Another one of the youngsters from France on the way up, 26 years of age. Now, the advantage, Phil, may well just be tilting across to the breakaway group because you can see the main field spreading across the road there. That's an indication that the pressure is off just a little bit as we continue to see Orica Greenedge doing all of the work on the front end of this group with Cannondale ready to come forward. And Nick Roach again. youngest rider as well inside. Simon Yates, this is the King of the Mountains leader here, number 21, Jakin Rodriguez. Well, after his brilliant day uh, two days ago, I'm rather surprised to see him taking it easy at this point. Well, it's tough, Phil, when you're coming back from injury as he is after that very nasty crash he had in the Giro. You'll have good days and bad days. But as far as he's concerned, he's not too concerned about the points on the daylight today. He's concerned about getting himself uh, back into form for the last week of the race. Nick Roach here, look at his face there, his mouth wide open, gasping for as much oxygen as he can get into his body there. He knows if he can get over the top of this climb with a, a 30 or 40 second advantage, there's a slight chance he might hold on because there's a lot of damage downhill to go although there's still a little bit of false flat before he starts the final descent of the day could be desperate kilometer to go for Nicholas Rhodes and officially all the hills are behind him today not quite true uh, but even so he's going to be a little bit relieved if he can hold his lead now first time anybody's put any time into the peloton for quite a considerable while here Roach has decided it's all or nothing here having lost the team leader Alberto Contador the day before yesterday they are racing for stage wins they've clearly stated that in the press and uh, Nicholas Roach will be thinking of Alberto he was the boy that gave his bike to Alberto uh, after he had the problem which eventually took oh, him out crash. Of has a crash here touch your wheels on the way up as well well, that's uh, Scarponi on the left-hand side, and that's uh, Jose Serpa on the right-hand side. Two very good climbers, but obviously feel a little bit of fatigue there. They've uh, locked their handlebars and gone down, and those kind of crashes are usually very, very hard ones. And as th that has inspired the peloton, because they're picking up Bacalens, Gautier, Herada. There's only Nicholas Roach left now, and it's, it's all or nothing for Nicholas. One thing, Phil, uh, actually, when you have a look at the main field, it, there's not many riders left in this group. I'm presuming the majority of the high-placed riders in the overall standings are here, but we've had a serious sorting out on this uh, rather undulating course, which is certainly not a high mountain course today. No, they've actually uh, been going off the back. Of that uh, Peter Sagan is still there, otherwise Cannondale wouldn't be doing all the work they're doing. The pace at the moment is being uh, put on by Alessandro De Marchi, who we saw in action in the Vosges as well. There he is try to get the lead in the King of the Mountains Luke Durbridge is just behind him uh, two riders still left with uh, Nibali the yellow jersey it's not a race for yellow today nobody troubling him it's been a good day out for the yellow jersey one day in after the rest day of the Tour de France just looking at this uh, speed over these very heavy roads this afternoon almost makes you feel uh, quite tired yourself and now here is the summit of the final climb of the day but it's not the end of the climbing this afternoon as uh, Nicholas Roach goes over the top, starts to get a little bit of respite, but I'll tell you what, uh, one thing that the race organisers have done, Phil, uh, rather nastily, they've thrown another little ascent into the top of the uh, road above the Lake Genin, which is rather a leg breaker. Then he can uh, set, fair, fet, say, set sail for the finish. Well, let's see how he copes with it now, because a short descent, not very much of a descent, then we're on to that little last one before we descend down to Oyenix, and really, if he's holding on to around about 20 seconds over the top of this next little hill, which he's not categorised, uh, then he's got a real chance. He'll take risks on the way down into Oyenix. There's Lac Genin. Yes, a beautiful little lake in the uh, medium elevation of the massive of the Jura. This area, by the way, has a nickname of Little Canada, and uh, it's classified as one of the most picturesque little sites in the region. Well, I don't know if you saw that Oyenix made with canoes, kayaks. Oyanax with kayaks. Right, uh, further back down the road here, the one man who leads uh, a lone day in the Tour de France is the man at the back, where's number 91, the leader of uh, Garmin Sharp. 22 minutes and 24 seconds. Well, fingers crossed for Andrew Talansky. He's still got a good 
10 to 12 minutes uh, at least in hand and maybe a little bit more than that depending on the average speed because of for every kilometer an hour over a certain amount uh, you get an extra percentage point which is uh, multiplied onto the uh, finishing time of the day so to Lansky, fingers crossed may well have done enough to stay in the Tour de France today but back down to the actual race itself it's only 10 seconds now the gap of uh, Nicholas Roach it's a very nasty descent here Phil and you might just have noticed that little corner there was quite dodgy as it's um it looked like big old tony martin coming to it is because tony martin that rider from omega farmer quick stop has got a red number on his back well look at the queue here to get around the corner one rider taking the really tricky approach there well another reason for hoping it's uh, for saying thank heavens it's not raining today here on this course and thank heavens it's not uh, a whole main field that's charging down this descent no. because these are great racing roads for a small group of riders. Uh, Nicholas Roach obviously realises this, he knows it's technical, he knows it's testing and he's holding on to the 12 second advantage. This is the little descent we talked about as we go down to the outskirts and start to ride around Lac Genin that we just saw a little bit uh, a few moments ago. Then he's got uh, a nasty climb of about two kilometres then he can set fail, set sail for the finish line. Keeps looking over his shoulder. Look how narrow these roads are. Woo, dodgy. Nine wins throughout his career. Nicholas Roach started as a professional back in 2005, but he's having a great season. Uh, this rider, and he had a big win in a race known as the Route de Sud, the route in the south, uh, and that was a good win for him this year. So good preparation race for the Tour. He's got good form, and now he's riding for himself, no longer in the defence of Alberto Contador. However, he's got a certain Tony Martin. Well, it's all over now because Tony Martin has closed down the gap. In fact, he's well, opened a out a slight advantage as well on this descent. Well, Amiga Farmer quick step played one card with Jan Bakelance. That didn't work, so Martin's taken control of the race. As he comes around this corner, he will show us how to descend. This runs a crazy downhill up. This is Harada here, number 14, who was in that front group. Just watching affairs on the back of the race here at the moment. So. So, uh, échappé terminé is what the uh, French are now announcing on uh, race radio. So it is all back together. This is the yellow jersey group. Well, they say échappé terminé, but there's actually a little bit of a split there being formed by this man on the front. And this is Tony Martin, the big man from Germany, uh, the winner of a stage a little while back. And now he is looking to open up the gap he's a tough man Tony Martin is an unbelievable character that's him on the front uh, the yellow jersey is in contact I can see a green jersey but at speeds like this uh, going downhill uh, I'm pretty certain it must be Peter Sagan Sagan is a very good descender the uh, gap back to Andrew Talansky a long long way back the road at 22 and a quarter minutes but we're now seeing a small group prizing advantage 15 kilometers to go Inside of 15 kilometers, that's nine miles of racing now. Tony Martin is there. The yellow jersey of Vincenzo Nibali is there. So too is Jan Bakalans. So looking here at this very select group and uh, well, Vincenzo Nibali doesn't miss many moves, does he? As I think he's got himself onto the back of that group. I'm not too sure actually if he has. Is he still in his chase group? Now Nibali's in the he's front in there, part of the there. split. He's yeah. been very, very attentive. Peter Sagan in his green jersey as leader of the points competition. He is there as well. The uh, world champion is not far away. Uh, in fact, they're just saying Rui Costa is in fact getting dropped on the descent. And uh, that is all because of the power being applied in this group by Tony Martin. Well, Nibali is in this group. So too Peter Sagan. So there's still trouble here. Peter Sagan's not going to let go of this one now after all the work his team has done to put him in this position. And he's got all the, all the categorised clients behind him. Uh, but uh, you can't... Uh, you've got to take your hat off for the Amiga Farmer Quickstep. They've got so many plans they are real chess players in the Tour de France this year just uh, in trouble a little bit at the back is uh, Benya in Tausti yeah but he's done a lot of work for Alejandro Valverde now Valverde is not far I'm pretty sure Valverde yes he is just over to the left hand yeah. side you can spot Alejandro Valverde in this group they've got a slight advantage there'll be a lot of scurrying going on now to try and pull this all back together 
Little uh, second group there is catching up with the tail of this group, so it's uh, still a big peloton. It's a very, very good sprint finish, by the way. It's outside just after two kilometers to go. They make a left turn, and then it's a sprint right along to the line. So it's perfect for the sprinters if they can clear these hills. But it's fair to say that there are hardly no pure sprinters left here. Well, Rui Costa, who starts the day in ninth place in the overall standings, is getting tailed off the back uh, with Jan Bakalac. That's him there, number 111. He's got the white jersey with the rainbow bands around the middle. He actually, Phil, got caught out on the downhill part of this course. Well, he might well come back then, because we're on to that little kicker now, which is not a categorised climb. It's only short, and then we're on our way down to the finish in Oyenix. 13.8 kilometres to go. It's still De Marquis who's setting the pace here for Cannondale. This is Galapan on the move, but they're after him. And it is Cannondale to try and desperately to keep this race together for Peter Sagan. This is the last climb of the day, remember, and then we're on the way down to the finish. Look at the speed of the main field behind there, not allowing anybody more than four or five metres advantage. The man on the front for Cannondale is inspired this afternoon. He's just thinking about his teammate behind him. He knows how fast Peter Sagan is. He knows a long way behind in the race today. The big sprinters we talked about in the first days of the Tour de France Andre Greipel, Marcel Kittel they've disappeared, these roads by the way are a bit sketchy coming down here now you can see the little bit of uh, the blackness on the surface, that's where the uh, tar over the top has started to melt because of the temperature coming down here but these guys now are not even thinking about that Phil, they're thinking about closing down the gap bringing it all back together thinking about a stage victory well, the contour's all downhill to Oyonex now. They're going to take risks on the way down, and Tony Martin has just been caught. 11.9 kilometres to go for Tony Martin. Uh, Tony, uh, Tony Gallopan and everybody else in this front group. They're virtually on his back wheel now. This is the group containing the world champion, I think. Although... So... Tony Gallopan has really got a bit of power here this afternoon. He's uh, leaping off the front end of the group. A chance to see the uh, craggy limestone outcroppings here as we look down to the finish. That's where we're headed to. Oyonnax on the horizon. We're looking down on the capital city of the department, where well, we were briefly, of the Departement de Lain. And that is our first time ever finish in Oyonnax. We've had another great day of active racing here. And Nibali again demonstrating that he's up for every move. He followed that move when it split the field. Not looking tired at all. Peter Sagan will not be feeling that confident with all of these riders still with him. Just noticed uh, Mickey Rogers uh, making an incursion there to the front of his group. Uh, he was a rider whose name I, I conjured up today as a possibility of a victor. He was the last ride, last rider to would be alongside Alberto Contador the other day before Alberto Contador abandoned. Well, he's still there, just ahead, uh, Galapan, with the Nibali Sagan and Roman Bardet group. Uh, so the white jersey is in this group of Roman Bardet. Nibali just keeping himself out of trouble. He's about to 15 riders down the pack at the moment and leaving his team to set the chase. Yeah, but look at uh, Sagan. He's never outside of the top five riders. He's up there now into third position. This is the second group on the road. The gap between uh, Tony Gallopin, who's starting to open up a little bit of an advantage now, is 15 seconds. And never scared of doing any pacemaking is Peter Sagan. 23 minutes and 56 seconds, our computer is saying. 24 minutes on the screen for Andrew Talansky, who's fighting elimination now and last week was fighting for the yellow jersey in the tour. At 10 kilometres to go now, it looks like Peter Sagan is in a crouch position on the front. Well, when it comes to his turn to do the pacemaking, he's never scared of working at all. I feel a bit sorry for poor old Alessandro Di Marchi on the back there for Canadell. He's done as much as he can. He's worked his hard out now for Peter Sagan so if Peter Sagan wants to win he now has to assume the responsibility of the chase all on his own and because he is so fast he won't get too many mates in this group but look at him he's taking advantage of the descent to ride away from the peloton this is Sagan's Sagan's great skill is going downhill remember on the early stage of the race he rode away from the riders on his own when he was chasing points they couldn't they didn't have his descending skills and that road looks as though it's a little bit damp but I don't think it is I think it's melting tar on this occasion 
Well, we've got a, an official gap of 10 seconds coming over race radio. 10 seconds is around about 150 metres. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the main field getting into the slipstream of Peter Sagan. He's going to take advantage of all of these little... Oh, they've gone round that corner, used every piece of tarmac that there is to keep the speed as high. We're looking here, for here Phil, at speeds of around about 45 to 50 miles an hour. Well, let's not forget there is a lone leader, the man who wore the yellow jersey on the eve uh, he took the yellow jersey on the eve of Bastille Day he lost it to the summit of the Planche de Belfi and he too is using every little bit of road pulls himself over as far as he can to the right hand side cuts the apex of the corner nice and tight keeping his speed high as possible well that's Tony Gallopan who is uh, still showing a 10 second advantage and has been all the way down at this descent we'll continue to descend with a, a couple of little uh, false flats all the way down to the finish the last uh, two kilometers are on flat roads and this is a demonstration here by Tony Gallopan he suffered and fought to keep his yellow jersey to uh, La Planche the other day it wasn't to be and uh, now he's slipped down the overall into fifth place uh, and Nibali will keep an eye on his progress but he's not going to get three minutes on the field today no that's not what he's looking for he's looking for a bit of individual glory he wants a stage victory yeah when he took the yellow jersey the other day his dad came to visit the race and when he uh, saw his son being presented with the yellow jersey on the finishing line big old Joel Gallopin who I actually raced with back in the 1980s Phil uh, it brought a little bit of a tear to his eye now I wonder what he's going to do if his son gets a stage victory the day after the rest day look at these guys they are taking all kinds of risks coming down these corners now they know that we're coming down to the possibility of a stage victory at the end of the day well while we're watching these pictures Nicholas Roach has been awarded the most uh, combative rider of the day or the most aggressive rider of the day which I think was well deserved and now it's another man uh, going uh, for gold here in Tony Gallopan uh, eight seconds officially they're using the whole road this is a very very quick descent it would have been treacherous in the wet but it's dry inside six kilometers to go is there a chance I wonder well it all depends on how he gets into the outskirts of town now the gap is six seconds that's not much more than about 75 yards he's fortunate here Phil because the road is uh, fairly tricky now this is Michael Rogers on the front now Michael Rogers uh, has won two stages of the Giro d'Italia and he's obviously another rider on Tinkoff Saxo Bank who has some freedom Johannes Aguirre down there as well that everybody's throwing everything in because the peloton uh, Nibali always in a good position making sure he can see what's going on but not keeping up with the riders because he doesn't want to lock onto the wheels it's a very dangerous fast descent they've just gone under five kilometers to go they can virtually see Gallopan and unfortunately it runs onto a very flat road for the last kilometer and three quarters and that could be the the uh, bad sign for Gallopan because Sagamo oh well they're nearly on him now well they are nearly right onto his wheel and uh, that, a lot of that pace making was done by Mickey Rogers there in the fluorescent yellow they're now up to the leader four riders but the yellow jersey group of Vincenzo Nibali is not very far behind in this group is Alejandro Valverde who's starting to look uh, like a very very serious contender and Roman Bardet the Frenchman who is the leader of the best young rider competition well this has put Sagan in a difficult position now he's joined the leaders what should he do push for home and maybe blunt his sprint which he's done uh, earlier in this race or should he allow them back on and use his sprint? It's four kilometers to go with four riders just ahead. Well, a flick of the elbow there from Kudkowski, the rider in the black and white jersey, Omega Pharma Quickstep. Come on, let's keep working together. We can stay off the front of this group. They've just spread across the road. And let's not forget, Phil, none of those riders are really important in the in the whole look of the picture. Although Kwiatkowski is at four and a half minutes down in 13th place, he's not going to pull back huge chunks of time at a moment like this. This is the group that they've left. There doesn't seem to be the same drive in that group now with the yellow jersey. He's not overly worried about these four. There's the gap as they come down to three and a half kilometers to go. Michael Rogers, the Australian who comes from Canada, uh, like uh, other riders like Nicholas Noach, have lost the leader in Alberto Contador. And they quickly said, now we ride for daily stagement in the tour. They've tried very hard to get one today. Just spotted TJ Van Garderen is in this group, so he'll be quite happy. Yeah, we well, was. Just 
just at the back there, so he uh, may well have taken a few risks on the descent. That will keep him high up in the overall standings tonight. He started the day in seventh place. Three kilometres to go. Mikhail Kwiatkowski, who was uh, putting a serious bid to lead the tour and failed in the Vosges, now trying to win the stage here at a first-time finish in Onyx. He's the rider on the front. No, he's not anymore because Tony Galapan at 2.7 kilometres to go somehow has attacked again. He has attacked again, but clawing his way back to the wheel of Tony Galapin is the man in the green, and that, of course, is Peter Sagan. There is the next group on the road. Uh, you've got BMC all over the front end of this group trying to pull it back together. Tony Galapin has got the gap. Uh, it's unbelievable, this, because in the background, I don't think the field will get onto this. The pace is flat out. They're hitting speeds of 50 miles an hour. They're running off now towards the two-kilometre marker. Soon after that marker, they make a sharp left, and it's dead straight and dead flat up to the finishing line and Tony Gallagher I've never seen this boy have a season like this well last year Phil I think it was uh, the bit of the coming of age when he won the San Sebastian classic but he is he comes from a huge family of cycling his uh, dad was a professional cyclist in the 1970s and 80s his uncle is a team manager he is riding on the crest of a wave look at all these uh, little corners here he's not he's going around these corners as if they're straight he's not even slowing down at all he now has about five seconds over over the three chases and 10 seconds back to the Nibali group. There are no more corners. That was the left turn to bring him up to the last kilometre and the finish itself now. He has found incredible strength to ride away from Kwiatkowski and Sagan and Michael Rogers. And I don't think there's very much they can do about it. We're now looking for the one kilometre banner and that is going to start everybody getting twitchy. Well, he has a quick look over his shoulder just to judge what is going on. He's got to pull himself inside out now. He's got to bury himself in these final few metres. He now knows. He's looked back and he can see that these guys, they've lost their impetus. It's going to go to Galloper and to France the day after the rest day. Under one kilometre to go for Tony Galloper. 900 metres left now. Peter Sagan took a look at Kwiatkowski, asked him to work. He didn't do so. That is the hesitation which has cost Sagan the stage because now Tony... Tony Galapan, he has become a superstar of Belgian cycling as he comes up here now towards the finishing line. A uh, French cycling, really, they're not, it's not Belgian cycling, on the Belgian team. This is going to be an incredible result. 48 hours after losing the lead of the Tour de France with a show of defiance in the Vosges, he takes it back. Well, not the yellow jersey, but he gets his stage win. They're massing behind him. But he's 350 metres to go. He'll have time for a victory salute. 300 to go. Paul, that was a breakaway to end breakaways. And what a way to win a stage of the Tour de France. The field had been snapping at his heels 10 seconds back for kilometres. And he's now going to win. What a cheer for France. The first victory for the French in the Tour de France. And he can do it in style. As he crosses the line, Galapin gets it. Well, uh, that was courage, Phil. That was dedication. That was never giving up and never losing your belief that you can win the stage just like that because that charge up to the line, that was brilliant. One look over his shoulder. Greg Van Avermark gritting his teeth on the far right of the picture there as they come up to the line. We can't see who got the placings in the pictures, but Galapan got the win. Race Radio is saying John Denkenkopf. I never saw him for the whole day. That's there him is, coming in up the through the middle now. Now, that was impressive for one of the sprinters to survive on a day like that. Simon Gerrans not too far away over on the left-hand side. And Greg Van Avermaet getting swept away in the charge towards the finish. Well, last time we saw this rider in similar position and similar pain, he was about to be taken away to be awarded the Maillot Jaune of the Tour de France. Now he'll come as a stage winner. Let's not forget, 26 minutes behind at the moment is the gap to Andrew Talansky. Well, look at that sprint by John Deckenkop. Uh, amazing that he actually got himself through the stage today. Talk about a replacement sprinter for uh, Giant Shimano. That was a phenomenal performance. Matteo Trentin, who won a stage the other day, he crossed the line in third place, and Daniel Bernati got fourth with Simon Gerrins fifth. And we saw the team with Talansky off the back. They made the switch pretty quickly, looking for the stage wins. As they went out, looking after the interests of Tom Yelta Schlechter.
the Dutchman, he didn't quite deliver, but he did try. A nod for Talansky. A smile comes across his face. It looks as if the cameraman or the motorbike pilot that have followed him have given him the nod. You'll be inside the time gut. They have supported him all the way through. Over half an hour behind the stage winner. But he is one of the heroes of the stage. And at the finish line, they're not leaving. They're going to clap him all the way home. 300 metres remaining for Andrew Talansky. All the way from Miami, the 25-year-old is heading through to the finish line in Oyonex. And it will be up to him as to whether he starts tomorrow or not. But based on the courage that he's shown today, so I'm pretty certain that Andrew Talansky will be on the start line tomorrow. Hats off to the pit bull as he comes in inside the cutoff. Talansky survives. Two big stories of the day, the victory for Tony Gallopan and the survival of Andrew Talansky. But what contrasting emotions. Well, I think they were so close, we're waiting, but it looks as though um, they've actually given everybody the same time. So virtually catching him on the line. The overall situation, uh, no distinct change overall. Richie Port, Valverde, Bardet, Gallopan stays in fifth place. Stage 12 of the Tour de France, a day that presents another opportunity. The supporters have come all to us here. As we're watching here, giant Shimano uh, tapped out the rhythm today. They're advertising the fact they want Marcel Kittel first across the line. Looks like it's 4.51 at the moment and building towards that five minute mark, approaching the biggest time gap originally we had early on. The breakaway got away some seven kilometres into the race. Peloton over the top and they're at 4.57, just on five minutes as they go over the second climb of the day. Yes, yeah, tough days for the riders. Yesterday there were only 45 le riders left in the front group as the leading uh, group now heads into the small town of uh, Wyatt. As uh, we can see that perched right on the top of uh, one of these little hills in this part of the world. In fact, uh, there was a Roman castle here uh, dating back to Roman times when the Romans invaded this part of the world. A magnificent day. We're finally uh, disappearing into the Tour de France that we really know because uh, these kind of views are the views that we've been expecting. We haven't been able to see them for the last few days because it certainly has been uh, very, very bad weather. Well, just looking here, that was the time for the ascension there, 8 minutes 54 seconds, and the Tour had such a spectacular start uh, in the UK, Paul, particularly in Yorkshire, and we were very sorry to learn uh, overnight that Brian Robinson, who was the first British cyclist to win a stage of the Tour de France back in 1958, was out cycling yesterday and uh, was in collision with a car in a one-way street and knocked off his bike, and he's in hospital. So, Brian, I'm sure Audi will send ITV's best wishes and everybody else's best wishes too uh, for the speedy recovery we understand in fact Brian has a broken collarbone broken ribs and a very nasty gash on his right arm in fact I spoke to his wife earlier today uh, how ironic because he was such a great bike rider for the Tour de France and he was the ambassador for those opening stages in Yorkshire as well he certainly was and I have to say Phil uh, having uh, raced in France for a, a long number of years uh, one of the uh, one of my team managers Raphael Gimignani always used to talk about Brian Robinson and how a phenomenal rider he was in the Tour de France so I think all of us here at the Tour de France uh, wish Brian a healthy and speedy recovery and get back on your bike soon mate here here and uh, we're looking at the five uh, pacemakers of the day and you know everybody when they attack now feels confident they might stay away to the end because there's no real organization we've lost the main defending champion of the tour Chris Froome we've lost the uh, Alberto Contador who was trying to win the tour for a third time uh, Andrew Talansky was a threat crashed so many times he left the race this morning uh, on an airplane back home to Spain and it, it is 
providing us with a lot of opportunity for the aggressor to succeed and it's going to make as we go into the Alps tomorrow our first outside category climb right to the finishing line of Chomrus. Yeah, but what a, what a, a year it has been for France as well, Phil, because uh, you've got to go back, as you mentioned this morning, a quarter of a century to see four French riders at this stage of the Tour de France inside of the top ten. They really are happy with their performances. These boys believe they can pull it all back together at the moment, but they would like a little help from the others, and at the moment they're not getting it. So, a uh, brief look down now once again uh, as uh, we continue to move around France and see some of these uh, magnificent uh, chateaux in this region. We're looking down of the, at the castle of uh, Bagnols en Beaujolais. The village itself is a beautiful little village uh, right amongst uh, the vines. The old castle there. Oh, there's a crash. This is in the leading group as well. And just as you're looking at the beauty of France, into the small village, just coming around the corner. And in fact, it's David de la Cruz. He just lost his will. You see, you can relax because of the beauty of France, but you must always pay attention. Just going around this corner, de la Cruz loses his front wheel and takes out the Dutch national champion. And there you just re briefly noticed that Sebastian van der Velde is down on the ground and David de la Cruz who just a few moments ago I was reading a quote from David de la Cruz who said I am living a dream at the moment I was told by some of my friends like Joachim Rodriguez forget about everything else because the Tour de France is so special and now he's on the ground well the crash Paul I mean you would never have expected that he just seemed to lose his traction and take out as well Sebastian Langeveld who's gone off up the road well the thing is Phil you know you're just at one moment you're enjoying the beauty of the French countryside and uh, just a touch of brakes going round the corner you see the front wheel slip away in front of you and I was just reading moments ago how much this guy David de la Cruz is enjoying his participation in the Tour de France That's for the first time just watch it again yeah as we see him on the round there, uh, it was definitely a case of uh, De La Cruz sliding. As this is the right-hand bend here, slid down in the blue, and, he, and then he took out Sebastian Langevelt as well. It wouldn't, must have wondered what on earth was going on there. Well, the funny thing is, Phil, you know, we complain about how slippery the roads can be uh, in the wet, but sometimes these roads can be quite treacherous in the dry. And when the front wheel goes away from you, as it did there, there's absolutely, well, almost nothing you can do to control a situation like that. So that really is uh, rather sad. And, uh, you know, when a rider stays on the ground for a long period of time like that, you're always a little bit concerned. Oh, absolutely. Well, let's hope he's OK. The breakaway now is two down at the moment, and let's hope that Langeveld, who must have been shocked by that because he wouldn't have seen him until his wheels were being scooped up by the falling uh, David de la Cruz from NetApp Endura. Still left up front, Gregory Rast, uh, Simon Clark, and uh, Florian Vachon. Vachon in the white, Rast in the black, and the other rider here, 183, is Simon Clark. They will be hoping for the return of those two rides. They won't know whether they've stopped or not at this minute in time. Well, especially uh, Sebastian Langevelt, who was uh, one of the strong riders in this group. But Race Radio has said that Langevelt is currently around about 40 seconds in arrears. Uh, while you just noticed uh, Simon Clark going to the back, put his hand up there. I think he wants to call the race car forward to try and get some information of just exactly what's going on. And at the, at the time, we can now see that the gap has stretched up to five and a half minutes. So uh, that's the maximum I think we've recorded since the start of the day. Yeah, and it, it was all going very much according to plan. Langeveld is chasing. First time check is 40 seconds back. He picked himself up very, very quickly indeed and jumped back on his bike. Not the same case for De La Cruz, the NetApp Endura rider. And we'll update you on that when we know something ourselves because our cameras have now moved on from the crash scene. Yes, and Langevelt had hardly uh, any chance to respond at all there because of the way that uh, De La Cruz crashed. He took the back wheel away from the Dutch uh, national champion and he was uh, very quickly on the ground. Unfortunately, the race organisation and the village there had got uh, the corner well protected with the straw bales over to the left-hand side when they dropped down. Little gaggle of spectators there on the middle of a main highway here as we swing onto this road. We're having a little chat here now, the two riders, uh, Vachon and Clark, having a little discussion because they're not too sure what were or what is going on. They're waiting to see uh, Langeveld come back. He's still around 40 seconds. Here's some advice 
for Vachon from his team. You're, they're all getting an update now on just exactly what's going on behind there. Very often, if you're in a breakaway situation like this, uh, you don't want to keep riding and have somebody who's crashed uh, leave, ride behind you at around about a minute because to, for a breakaway to succeed, you need power in numbers, and that's what they're trying to figure out. Do we sit up and wait for a couple of kilometres to allow Sebastian Langeveld to come back to the group? Well, this is the peloton now in the same village, so let's hope they make this corner. There's the yellow jersey of Nibali. Got his team all around him, keeping him safe. Gap is now the biggest it's been, 5.17. And there is the bend, and, yep, they're all safely round. I waited till our camera got round there, but they look as though they've all got round it. Yes, but the net at car, Phil, was parked over on the left-hand side of the road, so uh, there's still nothing coming through over race radio to give us an update of uh, exactly what's happening with David de la Cruz. Well, this is Sebastian Langeveld. He's talking with his team car. Now, he can't hang on to that team car too long. Even the, the demise of... Uh, of Tulansky yesterday he was fined and he was penalized 20 seconds for being in the slipstream of his team car during the chase yesterday well, we're looking at Sebastian Langeveld here at the moment and he's still chasing we've had the crash and Langeveld uh, as far as we know if he's rejoined but behind us there's no sign at all of uh, David de la Cruz and we saw the team car still parked at the crash scene so I don't think he's riding yet well it's one of those crazy crashes that happens uh, uh, very often on almost every day of the Tour de France just coming into a nice beautiful picturesque French village you go around a corner and all of a sudden front wheel slips away from him and those uh, crashes those um, accidents are very difficult to control Inside the last kilometre, just for the two leaders, at least they'll stay to share the prizes at the top here. Uh, but it's been a good climb, Paul, because the peloton has not pulled them back at all. It's pretty much locked in uh, just uh, for the last 10 kilometres. It's been two and a quarter minutes. But these two riders, uh, they'll be uh, thinking in the back of their minds, will the main field miscalculate here this afternoon? That's why guys go into the breakaway like this. Just looking at Simon Clark here, looking at the body language, he doesn't look like a rider who's starting to weaken. No, I don't think he is, as the peloton now continues to keep just a high tempo and the, the water carriers scurry up and down looking for their team leaders to pass out the water. They've drank some fluid today. This is the hottest day on the tour and it's taken us 12 days to find summer. Well, just looking down on that rider there a few moments ago with that new sort of uh, special pack for carrying uh, bottles of water. I don't know why somebody has not thought of that idea earlier than uh, this year in the Tour de France, but I can tell you one thing from experience. Trying to carry a bundle of bottles up a climb like this is not a lot of fun. In fact, I remember one instance when I was doing it for Stephen Roach in the Tour de France in 1985. We were going up a climb. It was so fast and so hot that I threw all the bottles <laughs> away. <laughs> I don't blame, there's enough problems carrying just your own weight up there, Not, uh, never to mind five or six bottles of water as well. There's the top of the climb of the Col de Bros, third category, so both riders receive points in the King of the Mountains, but that's a, a good lead at the moment for Joachim Rodriguez. He will be wearing the polka dot jersey tonight on the eve of the first assault into the Alps. That's when the points will really count. That's when we uh, get down to the serious business of the Tour de France. Uh, the big mountains starting to loom on the horizon. No challenge coming from the Simon Clark. He's going to allow Sebastian Langeveld to get maximum points. Up. But more important is these two riders have to collaborate. If you like, they've got to be mates for the next uh, 47 kilometres or about, uh, about 28 miles of racing. They speed away. If they keep up the pressure, they're not. Uh, they're only just over the hour now of racing left here because there's a lot of downhill. They might even get inside the hour for this last 30 miles because just one small climb to come. It's one small climb, but it does uh, climb up to quite a reasonable altitude. It climbs up to uh, 778 metres. It's a climb categorised over 10 kilometres with an average gradient of 3%, as we see the the terre des richesses or the richness of the land here in this part of France and uh, we can see that uh, the agriculturists, the farmers of the Rhone are once again welcoming the Tour de France into their region.
as we go over then the top of the climb the Col de Bros 887 meters there you can see the little design uh, of the region uh, with the uh, local kids down there and the farmers moving around and vive le vélo and of course uh, vive le tour that's a French chant at this time of the year and it's the dark green jerseys of Europe car that's all for the man Brian Kokar one day or another this youngster who was a silver medalist from uh, the Commonwealth Games in the Omnian the former world champion on the track as well and I think he will be threatening to try and get France another victory everybody extremely happy with the win yesterday by Tony Gallopin a brave move he attacked was caught and attacked again he fought all the way to the finish in fact he tried so hard he was quite violently sick after the finishing line he did recover quite quickly I was quite pleased that uh, they were uh, they were given him a number this morning with a, a V1 uh, written on it after his uh, after his number V1 so for victoire numero 1 uh, stage victory in the Tour de France 207 as we come well a little bit more than that 2 12 as we come up to the top of the climb and giant Shimano now taking up the pace once again now the big question is once we come to the next climb are team Cannondale going to start really whipping up the pace to see whether or not they can uh, eliminate the big sprint oh that's uh, the team helpers just trying to pass up the last bottles before we get down to the serious business of organizing the chase behind the two leaders So down the descent, a little bit of respite now as we uh, meander down towards uh, the valley and head down towards the next small town of the day. And once we went over the top of that climb, we'll go down into Dern, saint saint forin And uh, two so riders still surviving. As the riders continue, the gap is 2 minutes and 13 seconds. Forty-four kilometres more, about twenty-seven miles to race now. They're descending at fifty-five kilometres an hour. And Clark and his ex-teammate of the last two years, now on Garmin Sharp, Sebastian Langeveld, having to come together and work as friends. Well, this is pretty much uh, throwing down the gauntlet, Phil, uh, to the main field. It's uh, okay, you guys, you come out and catch us. And these two riders have to collaborate uh, over the next uh, twenty or thirty kilometres if they want to break the stranglehold of the sprinters. Although I think the sprinters today are thinking, you know, we've got two days on the horizon now. Once we leave Saint Etienne, we're going right into the mountains. We've got the mountain top finish to Chamrus, then we've got the mountain top finish to Rizul. So for us, we will uh, dig deeper into the suitcase of courage here this afternoon to try and pull it all back together for our men at the top. Well, long, steady drop here, but uh, not for too far before we have a little kick up and then we start a big plunge down before we start the last fourth category climb and they haven't lost or gained a second these two they're locked in riding at the same speed as that peloton yep it's locked in it's status quo and i'm just waiting phil on the edge of my seat to see when the lime green jerseys of canada will come to the front end of this group to give some assistance to, i'm sure they would want to try and eliminate marcel kittel from the main field by setting a really hard vicious tempo on this next climb of the day because if they drag marcel kittel over the last climb of the day i'm not sure anyone can beat him now away from the foot of the Côte de Grammont famous name in this sport of cycling isn't it Grammont the uh, great uh, Mur de Grammont yep. is the uh, little climb towards the end or used to be towards the end of the Tour of Flanders yes the one day classic held in April these are the two leaders they're still hold they've lost 10 seconds since they came down the long descent they're now about to start the climb it's reasonably long uphill but the climb itself is uh, not particularly hard it is a 10 kilometer ascent but the gradient is only three percent and uh, they're going to get on it uh, first but are they going to stay in it because i think we're going to see some really fast tempo riding on this climb now and uh, we, if we do the peloton itself may begin to crack as so we go down now into the town of san symphorien well this is the uh, collegiate uh, castle on the top but this uh, church was built on the rocky peak back as far as the 11th century uh, as part of the fortified castle of the Counts of Forez it was oh. demolished by the Counts of Lyon by the way in uh, around 1407 the native town devoted the part of the fortune to rebuild it 
The green jersey of Europe car just put two riders uh, into the chase here along with nearly the whole team that can still ride except John Deacon Kolb and uh, Marcel Kittel on the uh, giant Samano. Ji Cheng, the Chinese member, has been dropped now after a lot of work early on. 202 as they continue to set the pace. These are two very, very strong bike riders with a lot of honours to their credit, and they're not going to surrender. They're going to hope that they, on the next climb, that peloton will just blow itself apart. Yeah, but strangely enough, Phil, over the last 10 kilometres, they've lost hardly anything at all of no. their advantage. Although, as we look at the front end of the main field now, it really does appear to be changing a little bit. A lot more uh, keenness in the pressure being applied to the front end of the main field. This is uh, William Mabonet just coming around the corner. Had a nasty crash in Marseille on the Tour de France. His whole family were waiting to welcome him home, and they did. But unfortunately, he was lying on the road at the finish line. So, the two leaders, uh, they're looking at the next uh, distance to the finish that they will see will be 30 kilometres. We're now entering into the Loire Departement, uh, number 42. Uh, one of uh, France's 95 departments. And, of course, uh, the last uh, 30 kilometres of today's stage will be in the, the Loire. And as they continue to hold on to a, a reasonably good gap because of the kind of roads that we're going through this afternoon these guys will be starting to uh, garner a little bit of a, a dream that they will be able to outwit the main field this afternoon that's why they keep riding like this that's why they went into the breakaway early on today they saw the gap stretch up to six minutes but then most of the work throughout the day has been done by one team the team of one of the great sprinters and that of course is giant shimano this is the race uh, that we've done so far uh, three climbs behind us the intermediate sprint point very early on one climb on the horizon and that's the fourth category climb of the Côte de Grémont nothing really compared to what we will be lining ourselves up for tomorrow but now it seems now as if the chase is becoming to uh, be applied in earnest it's just gone inside of uh, two minutes but you can see now they're starting to stretch out into a very long line 75 kilometers an hour in the main field that's uh, 47 miles an hour and now is the moment when you've got to have nerves of steel you've got to hold your position in the line I'll let the arrière du peloton, there'll be a lot of guys just uh, trying to hold on to the wheel in front of them. Uh, another quick glimpse there, David Lopez, uh, the rider from uh, Team Sky. He, I think, is just waiting for the mountains. He's going to be a big ally to Richie Port. If Port feels uh, in the Alps that he's got a chance of cracking Vicenzo Nibali, he's going to have lots of strong men alongside him. I did notice that yesterday on the running towards the finish, uh, Vasily Kirienka actually sat up and lost a little bit of time, and I think not because he was fatigued, but probably because he was conserving energy on these flatter stages, waiting for the big assault once we go into the Alps. So, as we go through 30 kilometres to go, it's a minute and 50 seconds. Now is the time when they're going to have to really start to apply some pressure. Now, oh, this is a bit of a strange move. Now, Europe car have been doing the pacemaking, and the majority of that pacemaking, and in fact, uh, they've opened up quite a gap now, and uh, in fact, this was a planned move by Team Europe car. So that's the replay of the attack there, Paul, and that's an interesting move, the way they came away from the peloton. I don't think we were expecting that, but if they, if they are chased down here, the peloton will crack up on this climb. Well, that's uh, Gauthier in second position there, and uh, the rider from uh, Brittany, Perik Kemener, who've gone clear there. Now, it's a bit of a strange move because of so far throughout this uh, race, I've expected them to be doing the pacemaking for their man, uh, Brian Cocker. But this is an aggressive team, and, you know, they have been looking for something, and Jean-René Bernardo is the team manager of this team. He said, uh, watch out for Team Europe car. We've got a lot more cards to play. And while we're all lulled into a little bit of a false sense of security, saying, well, they're riding for the sprinter here this afternoon, they've obviously had another idea in the back of their minds. Well, these boys are getting on with the job, but 122, they, I think they'd be rather pleased if the two Europe car boys could get across quickly and make four. That will still put them in with a chance here. Now, just in trouble at the back of the race here now at the moment. It looks like we've got Alex House slipping away. 
from the action on this climb, riding visibly slower than the peloton. The crowd is massive on this climb. It's a long climb, this, just under 10 kilometers. Last climb of the day, long, fast descent, then flat roads into the finishing line. Yeah, one of the other riders just slipping off the back there as well was one of the animators of the early part of the stage. Uh, the big rider from Switzerland, Gregory Rast. These two are calculating that they will hold on to a slight bit of their advantage. But now there's this rather interesting move from uh, Europe car. And there is uh, Gauthier, a number 154. And he's actually quite an aggressive rider. He's got his own teammate with him who actually set up the move, Perik Keminer. They've got about uh, a 30-second advantage almost immediately over the peloton. Now, that's a bit of a shock because these guys have been doing most of the pacemaking. The question now is, who's going to chase behind? The helicopter picks up the peloton. Ab going uphill, OK, it's only 3 or 4%, but they're absolutely flying up this hill now, and it's hurt the sprinters who thought they were about to make the finishes in Etienne and have a chance to compete for the day's prizes. But at the moment, that is not going to happen. Remember that Peter Sagan is still there. Well, An attack as we look, and a well-timed attack. He saw Sebastian Langerfeld take a drink, and now Simon Clark has made a move. Well, uh, bear in mind, Phil, these two riders, uh, they were teammates, uh, they know each other very well, and I think Simon Clark, all of a sudden, uh, he could probably see the weakness and the fatigue in his teammate, his former teammate, sorry, as they did ride together for a long period of time, and he knew that Langevelt was now starting to weaken. He knew this was the moment that he had to make the move. He's got to try and get over the top of this uh, final climb of the day with a bit of an advantage, and if he can go over the top with a minute's advantage, he can start to dream about creating in the surprise today well although our pictures are saying he's got a minute and 23 in fact the race radio is saying he has a minute and 15 uh, I don't know whether he would know that but that's why he thought he couldn't wait wait any longer he is a climber he's been the king of the mountains of the wealth of Espana and that takes up the high mountains of that race but here today this is a bid for victory now and he's left himself 25 kilometers to do it so now you can see the urgency now in his pedalling style. He's uh, looking there, the indication, 25 kilometres to go. So now the lone leader, Simon Clark, is at 25 kilometres to go. His uh, former companion, uh, Sebastian Langevelt, is at around about 15 seconds. At 30 seconds, uh, we've got these two riders, uh, Cyril Gauthier and Peric Keminer. Keminer is a rider just in first position looking around the corner there can't be very much between them and Langevelt it's a minute and 20 seconds back to the main field which is already beginning to lose a large number of the big sprinters of the race including Marcel Kittel Clark just takes on board a little bit more fluid keeps himself topped up as much as possible and in fact uh, just as we look at him here, he's just uh, holding on and wants to hold on to as much as that advantage for the final charge downhill. Just watching the peloton climb here, they are flying up these slopes and this will make this feel like a mountain at these sort of speeds. Five riders uh, dictating the pace from uh, Giant Shimano with the Europa riders just behind blocking, if you like, uh, because they've got two men in between now, Cyril Gauthier and uh, Keminer. Langevelt is now on his own. Clark is pushing on. Here he is. And look over the shoulder because Sebastian Langevelt has gone from the picture. He'll be picked up by Gauthier shortly. They're now saying he's pushed on a bit here because he's built a minute and 20 seconds, so he's going clear again, Simon Clark. Well, this is going to be uh, interesting, Phil, because if he can get over the top of the climb, he will start to line up for around about a six or seven mile descent. Now, a lone rider can actually ride approximately the same pace as the main field going downhill, so if he can Chris this mountain here, that was very quickly going backwards. Hardly noticed the red, white and blue flash through the screen there. Sebastian Langer, he's going backwards. And go Gauthier and Kemener, the two Europe car riders, are now looking for Simon Clark's back wheel. He's a little bit ahead. We're looking at the two Europe car riders briefly, but this is the man who's lighting up the roads now of the Tour de France. 
Now he's trying to get a bottle, he can't get it out of the thing and he says, I can't move the bottle. And so Simon Clark continues to push on. Now he's, when he attacked, his lead was 1 minute 15. He's been up to 1 minute 20 over the bunch. And Sebastian Langerveld, who was with him, Paul, has just been swept away by the two riders chasing from Europe car. Well, you might just have noticed the, the car there, with the motorbike there, which has got bottles on the side there. Well, it looked to me as if he was trying to grab a bottle there before he gets to the top of the climb. And I'm not sure he could actually get the bottle out of the motorbike carrier, although he may well have taken a little bit of advantage to push himself off there. Uh, bien manger pour tout pour pédaler, which means uh, eat well to pedal. Well, you certainly need to eat well to pedal this afternoon. Uh, it really is uh, important to keep yourself uh, topped up with liquids and fluids in a day like this, and uh, always uh, the uh, the French uh, farmers doing a great job to support the sport of professional cycling. The lone leader, Phil, he's got to get over the top with uh, a good part of the one minute advantage and then it could be touch and go on the run down towards the finish i make him around about to two kilometers 1.2 miles to the top of the climb well he's not he's not very much at all now if they join up with him that will be an inspiration not only to him but the two frenchmen because the french are on the crest of a wave at the moment they've had their best tour de france for 25 years at the current moment it's a, a long time that's 26 years to go back since you've had four french riders inside of the top 10 Clark goes over the top of the climb, no problem for him, a single point in the King of the Mountains, but look, here are the two chases, they're not very far behind, I make it 12, 15 seconds. Eight seconds the gap as they start to go down the hill, once over this top, now this is going to see some serious descending on what appear to be very good roads here, it's a long way down between the 164th and the 177th kilometre, we're racing downhill. Yes, uh, this is now a rather interesting situation because Team Sky have come to the front. On the front is Bernie Eisel, second position behind him is uh, Richie Port. Now, this is not to win the stage for Team Sky, this is to start the sprint at the front end of the main field. Not very much. Simon Clark, you just see him taking a drink there, Phil, that's because he's going to wait for the two chasers. It will shortly be three men at the front of this race. Over the top. 55, 56 seconds. So, the peloton now. As uh, we see, the race situation has changed quite dramatically. There are three leaders, and now on the descent, they're chased by 55 seconds by the main field. Simon Clark looked over his shoulder, had time to take on board a drink, and he'll try and jump onto this tandem of uh, Frenchman uh, Peric Kemener in first position. Uh, Right behind him, it's Gauthier, and just getting onto the back now are the French tandem is Simon Clark. Now uh, at 52 seconds, Phil, they've got a long sweeping descent now into the outskirts of Saint-Étienne. This is going to be quite fun. Well, Clark's going to sit there now, two against one as far as he's concerned. Two boys in green against the Oliga rider. We'll wait and see how this develops, but he's really got to work well together. 49 seconds to the peloton, we're going to speed off this climb, ending up to 45, 50 miles now, the steep sections of the descent, and then long way down to the valley below, we don't even go to the valley below, but we get to a flat road, uh, and 39 seconds the gap, and it's all down to the riders on giant Shimano now, because the teams with the potential winners of the Tour de France are just riding at the front, watching. They are, they're watching and waiting. They want a safe ride down to the finish. They know that it's a little bit tricky over the last four or five kilometers. It always in, is when you charge into town. Simon Clark just sitting on the back. He can take advantage of this situation now and hope to recover a fraction. But Phil, that gap is coming down now quite quickly. It's down to 37 seconds. 40 miles an hour is what they're speeding down at the moment. We're showing 37 seconds. The race referees are shouting in my ear 40 seconds. Uh, three seconds could be the difference at the finishing line today, quite honestly, uh, because these boys have got to make a decision. They're trying to keep John Dagenkold in a position to win the day. He was second yesterday. They've lost their big sprinter, Marcel Kittel. He got dropped on the last climb of the day. Beautiful countryside, incredible racing roads, and now the high speed chase.
Massive big chaser right down into Santichen, uh, which uh, historically, uh, by the way, turning the clocks back many, many years, it used to be the capital of the French uh, cycling manufacturing industry. And then it was the it capital of uh, the uh, gun manufacturing industry. Now, it's gone through a number of hard years because of the economic decline. But today, it's hoping to host a very dramatic finish here of this stage of the Tour de France. Well, Simon Clark is not looking like a beaten man from those pictures. He's pretty cool, calm and collected back there. As we hover in, the peloton is packing again. 29 seconds. Now, what's happened here? This is Galapan at the back and hanging on. He needs to get back in that pack or he will lose time and his fifth place overall. He was yesterday's winner. Yes, but, you know, Phil, I think he's uh, paying for all of the efforts. He was in that massive breakaway uh, the day before Bastille Day to get himself the overall lead. Then a brilliant move yesterday. So I think today he's paying the cost. 15 kilometres to go, and underneath the banner will come the three riders. They're still holding them off, but they're inside half a minute now. And Tony Gallopan, the rider who won yesterday, has now been tailed off by a peloton, which is running at about 45 miles an hour. Those boys just about got round there. Good, tricky descent, uh, if you like, going downhill, but some guys do not like the downhill part of racing, and uh, just notice there, Kevin Ed, we seemed a little bit uh, uneasy going around the corner, which has left to uh, Simon Clark the responsibility of chasing down Gauthier. Gauthier obviously handling the bike very well. 25 seconds, you can... The speed of this main field, just listen to those wheels. Well, let's watch out for this next corner, because it nearly caught the leaders off guard. They're flying down here. No, they're through it safely as we come out the other side, 26 seconds the gap, and it is still giant Shimano, the boys in the black and white stripes who are trying to steer John Decken Cole to victory, but they're having a little trouble bringing back two Frenchmen and an Australian here. Well, 66 kilometres an hour, that's about 45 miles an hour going downhill as they really continue to apply the pressure. 26 seconds, uh, it's locked in, they're not going to make too much of an inroad into that gap now, Galapin is back on the tail oh, after the main field. This guy, Phil, he's riding on courage and guts and determination here in this Tour de France. Yes, well, the other Frenchman there, Nicolas Edé, came back with him from Coffin. He's also had a very good opening week in the Tour. They're back at the back of the bunch. They know once off this uh, descent, uh, then he should hold on in the peloton right up to the finishing line. And they've uh, managed to anchor back a serial Gautier. And now comes an attack from Kerem or his teammates, or is he just taking his turn at the front? The best descender of those three, I think, might well be the rider at the back at the moment, Gautier. He's a demon down the hills. As uh, the peloton now, the gaps appearing between the bikes because riders are having to take risks and they're being steered down this climb now uh, by uh, giant Shimano and they're taking risks. Well, you know, uh, I have to say, Phil, I always enjoyed going downhill. Uh, everyone knows I was not one of the greatest climbers, but if you're not a good climber, you have to take the enjoyment and excitement of going downhill fast, and there is an excitement if you're in a race like this. And these guys are in the black and white jerseys, giant Shimano, they are pushing it to the limits, but they don't want to uh, split up the front end of the main field because they want to keep it intact. Yellow jersey there, well, he has seemed very comfortable on any terrain that the Tour de France can throw at him so far, whether it's up the hills down the hills or riding over wet cobblestones so far he really has looked very good well, that's Vincenzo Nibli. I've heard a call and I think that's the problem on the right there that is Jan is a gear he has a flat tire uh, and yes it's confirmed a puncture Cravaison. that's a bad time to puncture for John and the champion of Spain as well so he's uh, going to be left he's not going to get back even with a good wheel change at these sort of speeds now, i recognize this road uh, from some years ago in the paris nice stage race as we run down into saint etienne now it's a long long descent this and there are some tricky bends on it yes but it's slightly different to the arrival into saint etienne of old because once they get to the bottom of the climb they've got around about seven or eight kilometers on the flat four miles of racing to get to the finish line and that's when i think it will be advantage to the main field they can get their organization yeah. going they can pick the pace up in the peloton to 35 40 miles an hour and that exciting gap of 18 seconds i'm sorry to say phil will get wiped out quite quickly oh, it's gone back to 19 now no it's back to 18 as we speak well the, the speed of the chase here by these riders they're pulling away from the peloton and really having great difficulty hanging on to this whole team of giant shimano uh, who have got on the back of that group uh, John Dagenkolb at the moment 17 seconds up the road 
is the French riders anxious they're so close to their third victory of the Tour de France but into the town of Sobier well Sobier and uh, now Simon Clark in a Europe car sandwich there he's quite happy to sit in the uh, slipstream of uh, Cyril Gauthier on the front but uh, as you can see these riders now really are they keep looking over the shoulders I think they're starting to realize Phil that uh, it's not very long now before they'll start to see the shadow of the main field 16 17 seconds that's around about 250 meters Clark looking over his shoulders to see whether or not he can catch sight of the peloton I tell you what he's been eating food at every opportunity I, I hope he's getting hunger flat Simon Clark because he hasn't got very long to go 10 kilometers to the finish we're looking for the banner they're under the 10 kilometer banner now they're still together but if we can see behind these riders we are going to see the field getting them in their sights there they are and in fact they now know as well Andre Greipel is still in this group Peter Sagan Brion Kokar uh, are in that group but one man is missing the big German sprinter who was so dominant in the first week of the Tour de France Marcel Kittel has been left behind damage being done at the back Joachim Rodriguez the leader of the King of the Mountains competition well he's going to cruise into the finish line today he's lost so much time overall in this bike race that Phil I think he's uh, going to take a back seat just five or six minutes we're not going to lose very much but we could conserve a little bit of energy for what's in store tomorrow big into the mountains well if this uh, break the bunch here does slow down they will get caught there is the French champion is his best shot at a stage win today normally he's been left by the time we get this far into a stage Arno Demar but he's actually right in there now right at the front so we could be in for another surprise we know Greipel is in there and we certainly know that Peter Sagan is in there also in there for Katusha in the red and white jerseys with the white strip right the way down the middle is Alexander Kristoff now if you want oh dear. you've got to take <laughs> risks if you want to be a sprinter and if there's a traffic circle in the middle of the road we'll just go over the top of it that way you don't have to slow down too much well let's smooth out the corner for some riders anyway talk about being alert everybody is on the edge of the saddle right now uh, Tony Martin now is coming to the front this is the marvels of Tony Martin, but he hasn't got uh, Renshaw here. Renshaw has been dropped uh, on the way up the climb. A bit further back down the road, the leader in the King of the Mountains, Jacim Rodriguez, he's been trying to save his energy the last two days. Tomorrow, he could go mountaineering again. Now, we've got uh, Alessandro Di Marchi getting up to the front here now for Cannondale as they try to organise the charge. The last man of those first five riders in green is there's Peter Sagan. I think there's been a crash on the right of the road. Riders are in the ditch. Oh, Andre Greipel has gone down there. Now, that is bad luck for the German champion. He's dragged his body over all of these mountains today and he crashes almost in the sight of the finishing line three kilometers out now that means they will lose time they've got to be inside three kilometers to be given the same time with an incident so they won't get the same time another rider down there was a Sylvain Chavanel well more importantly though Phil is the the champion of Germany because he would have been a big favorite but it's now down to Peter Sagan Peter Sagan is inside of three kilometers to go to the finish and he's got all of his teammates now dedicated to try and get him the victory that he's been looking for since day one well the only man really left in this peloton now of possibly two who could really go as quickly uh, as uh, as peter sagan would, would be uh, john dagan kolb i see there's two riders down there keeping out of trouble from team bmc but there was two bmc riders involved in that shunt as well Alessandro Di Marchi, who's the last man standing, uh, usually the strong man out on the course uh, for Cannondale. Tony Martin on the far right. Well, also noticing there, uh, Tinkoff Saxo moving forward. They'll be thinking about uh, their sprinter as well, uh, Daniele Benati. They don't have to look after Ale and Alberto Contador anymore, but certainly there's going to be a big lead out coming from these guys. Also, the man that Tony Martin is looking after will be uh, Matteo Trentin, who's already got a victory. Well, there, that's uh, Sylvain Chavanel on the left with uh, Andre Greipel. Yeah, a chance of a stage win gone. You leave the hand from the handlebar and make like this. And that's why you crashed. Yeah, you yeah. crashed. Your mistake. Well, uh, he's claiming, uh, unfortunately, he's blaming Sylvain Chavanel for the accident. He said, you hit my handlebar. It's your mistake, he said in English to Chavanel. 
But this is where the action is now. 1.8 kilometers to go. Cannondale getting a little bit disrupted by moves here. Because you're going to have to watch here also coming up is Team Katusha for Alexander Kristoff in those red jerseys. Now they're all trying to find wheels to follow. It's a little bit of disorganization now. They're losing a little bit of power. Sagan gets himself back into fourth or fifth position now. He's looking for a lead out. Matteo Trentin is right up there for Omega Pharma Quick Step. We're right into Santa Chen. There is the sweeper now. Very short. Shortly they'll start to see the uh, red kite across the road indicating a thousand meters to go but Phil you have to stay calm because this is a slightly uphill finish if you start the sprint too soon you will fade in the last 40 or 50 meters and you can get jumped right on the line well Alexander Kristoff is perfectly placed at the moment to finally get the stage when he's been looking for he's been in the first three but he hasn't won a stage now they're coming into what is a sprinter's delight as we get into the heart of St Etienne we are 1,000 meters from the line one kilometer to go well there's no doubt about one thing it is a sprinter's delight now and Sagan about eight men down as the sprint starts well uh, Omega Pharma Quickstep uh, are trying to set this up for their man Matteo Trenton uh, Kristoff is up into fourth position Peter Sagan is in fifth position in that dark green jersey Tony Martin where does he find the power to lead this all out Kwiatkowski is in second place and they're looking to do this again for Matteo Trentin in third but Trentin is the is in front of uh, Christoph and also Peter Sagan and now comes the French champion this is the closest he's had at finishing a sprint Dagan Bowl is coming in as well as Dagan Gold is coming through to the finishing line I was being challenged on the line here now this is Christoph in red but it looks as though Trentin is going to try and do it. They've opened the door for him. And as he goes for it, Christophe has got the better wheel here, being chased by Sagan and the French champion, Demar. Is he going to hang on, Christophe, as he comes to the line? And yes, he is. He gets the victory. Sagan is over in second place. So he's finally made good. Well, uh, that was what everybody was looking for this afternoon, but there were some uh, tricky little moves coming in on the run in there down towards the finish. Uh, Alexander Kristoff has been knocking on the door. Peter Sagan again frustrated. French national champion right up there as well. He is absolutely delighted with that. Well, that was uh, John Deckenkolb on the left-hand side uh, looking and he had to uh, slow down in the sprint. He was trying to move around the outside. Arno Demar there uh, just uh, going across the line in third place. Uh, Albacini in fourth. And uh, this is uh, pretty emotional for this guy.